Good day, everyone. Welcome to the CrossF annual meeting. Our first session is a welcome and CrossF updates by my colleagues Ed Bent, our executive director, and Ginny Hendricks, our chief program officer. My name is Johansen Obanda. I'm part of the community engagement team at CrossF, and I'm hosting uh, this session. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we have a few things that would be important for you to know uh, for today's for this session. Feel free to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. Also, a quick reminder about our code of conduct. Uh, please be respectful and kind to others throughout the session. Uh, and also join the discussion on Mastodon and X using um, hashtag CrossRef2024. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please use that to get your questions answered during the session. This session will be recorded. The slides and the recordings will be shared to you later. I will now welcome Ed to kick off the annual meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Uh, welcome to our annual meeting. Um, this is an important um, uh, event in Crossref's governance and uh, how we communicate uh, with our with our members. We've got a great lineup of events all during the day, uh, uh, accommodating different time zones. So um, I'm going to start off and give a little bit of an overview and setting the scene, talking about uh, our election, and then uh, hand over to our chief programs officer. Uh, Ginny Hendricks for uh, some updates on what we've been up to uh, for this year and what we have planned for uh, for the future. So <clears throat> I do want to take some time to talk about our uh, election uh, because Crossref is a membership association and that means that we are governed by our members and the organization uh, organizations are members of Crossref, and then they have representatives who um, uh, uh, are represent uh, that that organization on on the board. And so it's one member, one vote uh, in in the election. And every year, a certain number of seats are up for election. Um, and so we have a nominating process. So. Uh, every year, the board, <clears throat> we look at the board composition, we look at the skills of the people, we look at what the organization needs, and there's a remit given to a nominating committee. A public call goes out for nominations. It's open to any uh, representative from any member uh, to put in the nomination. And this year, we had uh, 53 uh, nominations for the uh, board seats that are available. So it's fairly <clears throat> fairly competitive uh, because we have uh, three seats or four seats available. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, and then the nominating committee uh, has a very uh, thorough process where they uh, review the candidates' statements. They also interview the candidates and, and uh, uh, choose candidates uh, for the slate. And we always have more candidates than there are uh, seats available. So we do have contested elections. And that means uh, there's uh, there's a vote, but uh, we also on the nominating committee have um, two board, uh, three board members, and then two general members. So um, look out for the call for expressions of interest uh, if you're interested in being on on the board, and also if a member is interested in being on the nominating committee, please contact Lucy, our chief operations officer. Um, so the. <clears throat> nominating committee this year, just to give them a, a, a thanks and uh, have their names here. We have the three board members here, James, Oscar, and Rose, and then uh, Ivy and Adam as general uh, members. And uh, they they did the work this year to um, uh, uh, review the nominations and choose the slate. And then they'll be putting forward recommendations to the board about how to improve the process. So every year we're looking to to, to improve the process and make it better. So the slate they've come up with is, <clears throat> um, we have two two tiers of, of candidates. Uh, tier one candidates are uh, those members uh, from uh, the bottom, uh, the, the lower fee uh, categories and tier two are for uh, from the, uh, uh, the larger, the medium and larger 
uh, members and that keeps uh, a good balance on, on the board. So in the tier one, they're electing uh, two seats. And so these are the candidates uh, for the election. Uh, information is available on the website with, uh, with their statements. And uh, then we're also electing two seats, so four seats altogether in the uh, tier two tier two category. So every member will have a voting contact. They will have received an email uh, about uh, the voting procedures and the link to actually uh, vote. So voting closes uh, later today at 1500 UTC. So there is still time uh, to vote. And as I said, a lot of people have already voted. The voting information went out uh, a while ago. But if there's any questions or problems, you can email uh, Lucy. And then we'll be announcing the results of that election uh, a little bit later uh, after the close uh, of the um, <clears throat> the annual meeting. Uh, so so we do have our formal annual meeting uh, later today at 1600 UTC where we'll certify those uh, uh, the election results and 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 announce them as well. So uh, if you, if you can make it, then that that's great. If not though, uh, all the sessions are, are being recorded and we'll announce the, the results after that. One of the things we do in the annual meeting is cover our um, uh, financial results. We give a report uh, on how things are going. So for those who can't make it, I thought I would just uh, mention that uh, mention that here. And so <clears throat> we have a, a chart here, which is a summary of uh, the organization's financial financials uh, from uh, 2019 until uh, 2024, and the 2024 results are uh, nine months of actuals plus three months of the, the forecast, because we're not finished uh, the year yet. And then you can see in the variance column here that we've got the, the difference between uh, 2023 actual results and um, uh, 2020, uh, 2024 uh, full year with the full year projections. So we have our uh, revenue, which uh, a piece of it comes from the membership fee. So we've got 4% growth there. That's been fairly standard over the last uh, few uh, last few years. Um, uh, we have uh, subscriber fees, which is our Metadata Plus uh, offering. That's gone down because, uh, well, there's a little typo there. It's the uh, consolidation of, of members. Uh, a couple of uh, our members had separate accounts, but the organizations uh, combined. So that's gone down. <clears throat> we also have similarity check fees, but most of the revenue comes from content registration, which is when organizations members register their content with us and register the metadata and get DOIs. And that's 8%, which is 8% uh, growth is really healthy. That follows the trends, however much gets published. Uh, is what's getting registered with Crossref, so that does that does vary, uh, but but we usually see uh, growth between uh, four and and uh, eight 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 percent. Uh, donated fees we uh, waive fees for um, uh, Ukrainian members uh, up uh, last uh, for two years. Uh, that's that's not happening this year, but we also have uh, our uh, gem gem program as well. Uh, which accounts for for some of this. So overall, um, you can see over the years we've had consistent revenue growth, and we had seven percent uh, for this year overall revenue growth. So that's very healthy. And then our expenses are divided into uh, personnel and non personnel, and those are going up about the going up about the same amount. And so uh, the total operating expenses are going up slightly more than uh, our revenue. That's something that we wouldn't want to have happen for. A longer term trend, but for a year or two, it's okay. Uh, and uh, we have a, um, a a healthy surplus as well. Uh, so the costs are going up because we're moving to the cloud as well. So that's 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 part of it. So just a brief overview of our financials, but I'm happy to say that uh, everything is uh, looking very healthy. So just as a reminder. I'll give our mission and vision. Uh, we're a nonprofit membership organization, and we rally the community, tag and share metadata, run an open infrastructure, use technology and make tools and services, all to help put research in context. And then our wider vision is connected to what we call the research nexus, 
Um, and we envision a rich and reusable open network of relationships connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions. And we really focus on the scholarly record and the integrity of the scholarly record so that the uh, global research community uh, can, can build on that uh, to benefit uh, society. And uh, I like this phrase that we've developed, it's called, and it says that metadata is the thread that is woven to produce such a network. And as you'll hear today, we'll be talking about uh, funding, um, uh, metadata, uh, research integrity, and uh, uh, lot, lots of these areas. And this is the vision that we're working towards. Uh, we're not there yet, so it's something we're aiming for. It's about better view of relationships uh, between content, all types of research outputs. It's something that just doesn't involve Crossref, but it involves ORCID uh, and Datasite and, and, and ROAR for affiliation identifiers. Uh, it's also about Crossref being transparent and exposing our, our things uh, ex externally. So we'll be working on that. And really in this uh, era of, of AI and uh, paper mills and fake content, evidence, provenance, and persistence are more critical than ever. So as I said, we're not there yet, but uh, uh, this, is what we're, this is what we're working towards. And just to highlight, uh, we'll be talking about this a little bit later at the panel session at 10 a.m. Uh, UTC, uh, but Crossref is an adopter of the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, these are uh, a set of principles created in 2015, but now there are uh, 21 organizations who've adopted them, and it covers areas around governance, sustainability, and, and insurance. And this is something else that, along with our mission and vision, that helps uh, shape how Crossref, uh, how Crossref operates going forward. So that'll be it for me uh, at the moment, and I will pass over to uh, to Ginny to give us an update on uh, progress and programs. Thank you very much. I will just share and then start the slideshow. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. Um, thanks for setting the scene there, Ed. Uh, I'm going to go through a little bit more uh, detail about what we've been doing this year, the things we've achieved, and um, how things are growing. So progress in terms of uh, the membership, as well as um, uh, goals to uh, enrich metadata and um, uh, developing tools and services. So first of all, um, this is a pretty uh, standard picture. We, for a few years now, have been getting around 200 members a month. Um, and you can imagine that is uh, quite a lot for our team to, to manage. Um, we saw a little drop. So this chart shows the number of new members joining every month. We have 21,000 members at the moment. Um, and we saw a little drop in 2021, um, which was partly to do, to do with um, some concerted effort on our part to combine memberships. So we had lots of maybe like multiple scholar journals at a single university that we encouraged to kind of club together. Um, but the last uh, couple of years and this year, we're expecting to do just over 2000 members. Um, and where are they coming from? Um, this isn't the usual chart that I show because I've kind of taken out the top trends. So actually the countries where um, Crossref membership is growing uh, is very much Indonesia. Indonesia makes up 15% of our membership actually. Um, but I've taken out Indonesia, India, um, US, UK, Turkey, because I wanted to show some of the countries that are um, you know, you would just wouldn't see on a list with such uh, with with the kind of uh, really um, uh, trending countries. So it's really great to see that uh, Pakistan, we had 60 new members this this year, Mexico, Bangladesh, Iraq, um, more coming from China uh, and lots of uh, yeah Asian and African countries there and Ecuador as well from South America and Peru. So this is the picture of where the Crossref membership is, is growing. Um, of course, not forgetting Indonesia and India and uh, those countries that have been growing for a number of years now. Um, so more stats for you, um, but I've highlighted just a few. Um, this is a, a set of um, 
I guess, uh, yeah, uh, data points that we share with our board uh, a couple of times a year. Uh, and I thought it'd be useful to share it with everybody. Um, we talk and Ed just uh, went over our vision of the research nexus. So that includes, of course, adding new records. So new objects and different types of objects registered with records in Crossref with the DOI. Um, and I've just highlighted a few here that seem to be growing a lot in the last year. So comparing October last year to October now, 2024, um, preprints have gone up 31%. So they're just over 2 million. Um, number of peer reviews is growing 41%. And as would be expected, the newer record types, so grants there at the bottom, because they're newer, the numbers are still quite low, but they've grown 46%. So we now have almost 130,000 grant records from about 35 uh, funder members. Um, and then this is what we call Research Nexus Connections, the top half of the, uh, of the table here. Um, so these are uh, relationships or links with other identifiers or um, uh, extra information about the records. Uh, and again, just highlighted three here. So um, the ORCID auto update program, which started, I think, in 2016, something like that, um, is still seeing huge growth. And we've automatically pushed to ORCID um, 21 million works by now. Um, so that's the total number that have been pushed, and that has grown 33% since uh, last year. So that's good. Um, as you would also expect, because it's a bit newer, raw IDs are also um, showing up on the most, uh, you know, fastest growing um, metadata activity from our members. So the records with raw IDs have gone up. They've doubled, actually, since last year. And um, just at the bottom there, you can see that the number of members now registering raw IDs for affiliations um, has gone up 80% as well. So we have 520 members from the 21,000 uh, to uh, who are sending us uh, raw IDs with their records. Um, and worth also mentioning cross mark retractions there. Um, many of you will remember that about a year ago, we announced we acquired, acquired the, um, the data set from Retraction Watch that is open and available, but separate from our um, metadata at the moment. Uh, so these are cross mark retractions within the cross ref metadata, and that's gone up 120% um, with about the same number of members sending us retractions at all. Um, so I think we can deduce from that that the same, more or less the same members are just getting more retractions, but they're also registering it with cross ref, which is fantastic because then they can be found um, by downstream users and in research integrity sleuths and so forth. Um, so kind of a, a, a step back and um, uh, a few larger numbers, more numbers for you, um, generally to show just the scale of Crossref. I mentioned that we have 21,000 organizational members. Uh, I think it's over 160 countries now. Um, we've had our first members from uh, countries like Sudan and um, I think Bolivia. And um, that's just great to see. It was also interesting to note as I was looking through the data last night that actually 50% of Crossref members are based in Asia. Um, and that's just important for us to keep in mind as we're planning our engagement activities over the next uh, couple of years as well. Um, also, interestingly, we capture organization type as well for, um, for all of our members. And they are self um uh, selected by the members and they, they can also be more than one so you could set yourself as a society and a publisher or as a library and a publisher um, but over 40 percent of our members are based at a university so they might be a library publishing program or they could be scholar-led journals um, but it's just interesting that that's quite a different makeup than uh, what Crossref started with 24 odd years ago um, we have a network of now 120 sponsoring organizations um, spanning probably a good 30 or 40 countries. Uh, and we also have 50 ambassadors that are really fantastic. They're a, an extension of our team um, and they are you know, very knowledgeable about Crossref and uh, help answer questions and um, you know, help us do kind of small translation projects and things like that. Um, 
We now have 162 million open metadata records. Uh, obviously, they will have a cross-ref DOI. Um, so that's a nice big number, but actually, um, how much are they being used? And those numbers are a little bit more interesting. So the DOIs are actually being resolved 1.3 billion times every month, um, which is uh, a lot. And it means that this system is vastly <laughs> work is working at a huge scale. So, uh, you know, those DOI resolutions, which means a click or a, a system that is following a DOI, um, you know, they're not interrupted, they resolve um, all of the time. Um, it's also worth noting that that uh, usage across all DOI registration agencies in all industries, Crossref makes up 94% of all of the DOI usage with that 1.3 billion. And then another uh, big number is the calls to our APIs. Um, we see about 2 uh, billion every month, so even more. And because it's open uh, and you don't have to, um, you can be anonymous, you don't have to um, identify yourself, but we uh, we know that Crossref metadata is used by just thousands and thousands of systems that ingest and reuse the metadata that our members uh, provide and that we match and, uh, and normalize. Um, so that's a lot of the, um, I guess, the stats about the state of the uh, membership growth and uh, how we're working towards uh, richer metadata. And uh, now I'm going to go into a little bit about the tools and services, some of the highlights of the year so far, um, and it will kind of set the scene for lots of uh, more dedicated um, sessions coming later today. Um, but first, uh, 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 another bit of scene setting, which are our four strategic themes, um, and this is how we organize the work, really. So. Um, that first one in green is we uh, we want to contribute to an environment where the community identifies and co-creates solutions for broad benefit. And that's really us kind of reflecting uh, trends in the community, leading uh, in, in many cases. Um, and so projects around uh, research integrity and um, uh, it, all sorts of things are in that uh, area. Um, sustainable source of complete, open and global scholarly metadata and relationships. That's really the big research nexus goal. So that's where all the metadata projects sit and um, uh, adding relationships and matching and uh, the REST API and things like that. Um, managing uh, Crossref openly and sustainably. Um, so we're modernizing and making transparent all of our operations, uh, which includes financial operations, um, people operations, technical operations, um, and we're working to make all of those policies and processes more uh, transparent and more uh, up-to-date and modern. Uh, and we want to expose all of that uh, even more so that we're accountable to, uh, to all of you, uh, the organizations that govern us. Um, and we also uh, have a goal to uh, foster a strong team. Um, we do have a really strong team and uh, they're very committed. And uh, we have lots of projects in here around um, sort of, uh, you know, global equity and, and things like that. So um, I'll now go into, I'm just going to check the time. Okay, good. Um, I'll now go into uh, what we sort of collectively think are some of the highlights so far of the year. So what we've been working on, but also what's actually been delivered and released. So, uh, and this is where almost every single one of these bullet points has a session or will come up in more detail later on today in a dedicated um, slot. So uh, we embarked uh, just over a year ago on the uh, resourcing Crossref for future sustainability uh, work, and that is in a research phase. This is looking at um, uh, primarily five projects all around our fees, and many of you will have received surveys or invitations to um, be on our member uh, membership and fees committee. And um, there's a whole session dedicated to that later, but we've been spending a lot of time looking at data, looking at fees, asking uh, members and plus subscribers all about how uh, how they are um, working with Crossref and able to afford it. Um, and we have a number of goals there. First of all, is to make the fees more equitable 
Uh, we also want to simplify them because over the years we've added so many uh, different sort of cases or um, discounts or um, new content types being a different fee and things like that. So we'd like to simplify that. Um, we've also been uh, undertaking quite a lot of um, uh, activities, engagement activities around the integrity of the scholarly record, or ISR as we call it, um, and a number of our uh, team members have been talking with institutions and obviously publishers and uh, funders as well, uh, so we've been conducting sort of roundtables and uh, learning more about uh, a group uh, of research integrity sleuths as well, and getting them up to date on what they could learn from the Crossref metadata that might be considered trust signals. So that's quite a, an ongoing program of activities. Um, this year, we also uh, celebrated five years of the grant linking system. Um, so rather than just calling it grant IDs, it's a whole network of uh, of uh, relationships, really. So. Obviously, the main point of funders registering their grants is so that they can link them with the outputs um, uh, and, in particular, published papers. Um, and I showed the data a couple of slides ago that showed that's doubled. So we've got about 130,000 uh, grant records, 35 members, and it's been going five years. And it's really, uh, it seems to have sort of reached a, a bit of a tipping point. So we're, we're going to see that grow next year for sure even more. Um, internally, I, I think I briefly mentioned that, you know, managing 200 new members a month uh, in quite a manual way has been problematic for a few years. So this year, uh, we've been able to automate new member onboarding, which has saved us something about two, something like 200 hours a year. Um, and we're also automatically raising like membership orders and invoices, which was all the manual process uh, done by our team until this year. Uh, we also released a new form for um, registering journal article records. Um, that was just about a month ago. Uh, there's a, I, last I heard we'd had 10 uh, new DOIs for journal articles come through that new form. So we're, uh, we've just released it fairly, fairly quietly. And um, the aim is for that eventually to become our primary uh, sort of non- automated way of registering uh, journal articles with Crossref. That form already works for grants. That was the first um, record we um, supported with that tool, but now journal articles. So that's uh, there's going to be more to come on that. Uh, we also upgraded our participation reports, uh, which is a sort of dashboard for each member on the, the metadata elements that they're registering through Crossref. Um, and so that now shows affiliations, so the free text uh, string, affiliation strings, and also raw IDs as well. So everyone should have a look at their participation reports. Uh, often there's surprises even to members themselves about what's actually getting through to Crossref. Um, we also launched a new API learning hub, uh, which I'm hoping somebody will put the link to in the chat. Um, and that's going to be uh, added to over the years, but it's a real... It's representing a real focus we have on working with our metadata users uh, and supporting them. So it's links to tutorials and um, different ways of interrogating the metadata. Uh, we did uh, earlier in the year, so this time last year, we were talking a lot about a relationships API. This was a sort of new prototype. We were um, initially looking to launch data citations through. Um, but we took the decision to pause the development of that earlier this year, quite early this year in March, um, because uh, we hadn't developed it in a way that would uh, scale. So we're going to reconsider that next year. Um, but in the meantime, that allowed us to catch up on a number of things. So we were able to uh, redirect the technical team towards quite a major project to um, migrate from a closed source database system to an open source one. And you may have had uh, um, notifications about downtime. So our entire system was down for 24 hours, actually twice, because we did it in two parts uh, and completed that in uh, September, uh, which was, you know, very gratifying. 
Um, the last couple of things. So uh, we've also been able to focus a little bit more on schema development, which has been on the back burner, I would say, for a number of years. And that's now uh, our major focus. Uh, the first thing we looked at this year was to include raw um, IDs as funder identifiers. So that is uh, the work is already complete in the REST API and hopefully by the end of the year, um, we'll be able to accept those in our in our uh, deposits as well. And yeah, we've been spending a lot of time fixing a lot of data inconsistencies in our REST API. So that's um, it's been really good to have time to focus on some of these things that, you know, make sure that um, we have uh, reliable data and uh, systems that people can use. This is my last slide and I'm aware I've gone over a minute, but I just wanted to show um, a little picture of what we're working on for the next couple of months to the end of the year, um, which is another infrastructure project to move out of the data center and into a cloud based um, hosting system. Uh, we have kicked off the work for Metadata Schema 5.4, which will include uh, reference types, among other things, and Patricia has a, a dedicated session on that later. Um, we're going to continue raw and finish off that work, as I said, for um, funder identification. Um, lots of ongoing work that I won't go into, and then some of the things were focused on the, on the right-hand side of the slide there. Um, so looking at uh, matching, in particular for preprints, getting the retroaction watch data in the REST API, um and more metadata and kind of infrastructure projects so yeah i think having gone over by two minutes i should probably stop there and hopefully if there are questions in the chat i can answer them uh, offline and i will hand over to lena for some demos of some of those things i just mentioned thank you very much Jenny, um, I'm going to assume everyone can see the slides now. I'm sure someone will let me know if uh, if you can't, but I see Ginny nodding. Yeah. So we're going to seamlessly transition to the demo session then. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lena. I'm part of the programs and services team at Crossref. I'm based in beautiful but not very sunny Berlin in Germany. Um, and I work on some of the projects here at Crossref that relate to us um, kind of reflecting and leading trends that we see in our community. And on that note, we've got three demos today for you. So first off, our senior front-end engineer, Patrick, uh, sorry, senior front-end developer, very important, uh, <laughs> important difference, I think is technically the title. Um, Patrick has joined me today. He's going to show you a browser plugin um, that we've developed that enhances the accessibility of DOIs and improves the browsing experience for um, people who use screen readers or other assistive technologies. And then Patrick is gonna speak some more um, briefly about how we accept community contributions to our code here at Crossref. And he'll highlight some changes to our participation reports interface that Jenny's already mentioned as an example of that process. And then finally, I am going to take you through um, our new record registration tool for journal articles, which Ginny has also already highlighted earlier, um, which is now available for you to register some journal article metadata with us. So some pretty good stuff today. If you have questions or comments, you can add them to the Q&A anytime. We're gonna leave some time hopefully at the end of the session to cover some of your questions. Um, and now I think Patrick can take it away. Thanks, Lena. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Patrick. I'm uh, a front end developer here at Crossref. And um, a couple of things that I'd like to um, talk to you about today, um, starting off, as Lena already said, uh, with a new DOI accessibility browser plugin. Um, so, DOI accessibility, um, what do we mean by that? And why do we need to improve it? Um, by DOI accessibility, I primarily mean accessibility of DOI links on web pages, such as publisher landing pages. Um, DOI links, as I'm sure you all know, are a vital part of the scholarly ecosystem and they form the cornerstone of all the metadata that's registered with Crossref. Um, they're the canonical identifier used to find, cite and assess research and they work 
very well in their primary function. Um, they're stable, they're reliable identifiers, um, and they provide a robust way to link between and to scholarly works. They're also easy to use, they're easy to follow, um, they're easy to copy and paste and put in your reference lists and other places where you need that identifier. Or at least they are all that if you can see them. Um, where you could do better with a DOI link um, is as an accessible link for users of screen readers and other assistive technologies. Um, a screen reader user has a lot less of the access to the visual context, which is the title, and maybe the abstract and associated metadata that's displayed around a DOI link on a landing page. Um, and that's the information that a sighted user would use to put that DOI into context um, and have a way of knowing where that DOI is going to lead. Um, a user of a screen reader doesn't have that visual context and screen readers tend to um, look at links in a, in a different way than um, a sighted user does on a page. So we were aware that there was a, a challenge around that accessibility. So the challenge we faced was to find a way of improving the experience for screen reader users while also not changing the default experience and the behavior that sighted users and other users are used to. Um, also people using voice command or other such assist, um, uh, assistive technologies. So links should be able to be clearly displayed with the full identifier. They should be clickable and they should be easy to copy and paste. So following some early community consultations, which were very um, well responded to, and thank you for everyone who uh, responded to those, um, and a very enlightening meeting with the jats for our accessibility group, it became clear that the um, changes just to the DOI link itself were not going to achieve this goal of improvement without um, changes to other users. Um, we found that changes to one that benefited one constituency had immediate equivalent detrimental effects on another. Um, and the core issue for anyone kind of technically minded um, is that a DOI link is a, is a URI, it's a uniform resource uh, identifier. So the standard URL or uniform resource locator accessibility techniques don't directly apply here. So you follow one WCAG rule or apply an ARIA technique and it will break another one. Um, so we found ourselves kind of going around this loop um, and looking for a solution. So it became clear that we needed a, a different approach and more than that, we needed to test the approach directly in the field. Um, we needed to let users of the technology trial the solution and let us know how it worked for them. Uh, we needed to work with the community and co-create a solution that worked best for all of their use cases, not just one particular assistive technology. Um, so I'm happy to announce that we've created and released a DOI accessibility enhancement browser plugin. Um, you can install it today for Firefox or from the add-on store. Uh, we have a Chrome release in the pipeline, um, and you can also install that directly from our GitLab repo for Chrome if you wish to. And so it's a little challenging to demonstrate screen reader functionality over a Zoom call. Um, so I'm going to show you the changes to the code in the page. Um, but this browser extension will scan any web page for DOI links, and when it finds them, it will query the Crossref REST API um, for the title of the work. Um, and uh, when it finds them, it will display that for the, the screen reader user. You can see there's a way to highlight the links to uh, show what's changed to help develop the extension. Um, when it finds the DOI link and it looks it up in the REST API, the uh, title is added as a screen reader only link, which is invisible to sighted users and the original cited link is marked up so it's not announced by screen readers, which is a crucial part of keeping the same uh, experience for everybody. Um, this means that when a screen reader user focuses on the DOI link, the title of the paper is read out rather than the full HTTPS DOI.org slash an opaque identifier. And that's the key, the key um, uh, functionality of, of our plugin. So this is very much a community process. The extension is open source. Uh, our GitLab repo is open. We're very interested in how this solution works for people in real life, in real situations. Um, and we encourage feedback and contributions either via our GitLab issues or direct by email or through our community forum. Uh, we're expecting to iterate on this and to make improvements driven by the needs of the community. So I invite you to install the Firefox extension today, uh, check it out in the GitLab repo and let us know uh, how it works for you and your different workflows, because we're very aware that different people have very different needs in this area. So um, an iterative approach is, is clearly the way forward. I'm just going to pause uh, to check. The... Yeah, I think I saw a ping from the Q&A. 
but I'm not sure if it's letting me look at it while I'm sharing. So you don't okay. have to. Did the accessibility so yes, there's a good question. Did the accessibility plugin come out of a WCAG orbit or similar, or was it raised by uh, the membership community? So I think it's a, a mixture of both. So we originally had a uh, a question. Uh, Ginny's going to ask this question. So let me pass over to Ginny. Am I? I just said we'll answer it live. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you, Colin. Just shows how much I know about Zoom controls. I will continue answering it live. Uh, we had the UK <laughs> Food Standards Agency um, contact us um, as part, I think, of a w, um, WCAG organ asking whether the links that they were using were accessible, which triggered this whole um, very relevant question. So uh, a, a bit of both is the answer to that one. Um, so yes, do please install the extension and um, yeah, let us know how it works because um, uh, I, for one, can try this with screen readers, but it's just not the same as you, if you use them every day. So we're very much looking for for more input. So moving on, um, talking about community contributions leads me very neatly onto our next example, which is um, uh, our improvements to our participation reports interface. So uh, at Crossref, we kind of live by the POSI principles. So that's the principles of open scholarly infrastructure that Ed uh, and Ginny mentioned earlier. And uh, part of those principles is a commitment to making all of our software and our data open. Uh, a benefit of open source software is that it opens the doors to co-creation with members of all sorts of communities. And I'm very happy to say that we recently received such contribution from CWTS Leiden uh, to help improve our participation reports interface. Um, if you're not familiar with participation reports, they're a visualization of our members' metadata. It's available uh, free via our REST. Uh, the, the data is freely available via our REST API. The reports are also freely available uh, via our website, and they show you the percentage of a metadata's a member's metadata records um, for key metadata elements, such as abstracts or references. The recent contribution adds very much requested affiliations of RIDs, as Ginny mentioned. Um, so it brings a more comprehensive view of the metadata that you can now send to Crossref. So working with this contribution was very rewarding and also very helpful um, in honing our community contribution guidance. So we're rolling out across all of our open source repositories um, updated contribution guidelines to help people contribute across all of our platforms. Um, you can find our contribution guide uh, on the Participation Reports GitLab homepage and shortly on our other repos as well. So what you can see in the slide there is, as well as the existing metadata for uh, references, ORCIDs, et cetera, um, ORCID IDs and funder registry IDs, we have affiliations and raw IDs at the bottom. Um, these are the new metadata elements that have been added via this contribution. Um, it was also very helpful to go through this and sort of hone our review process and just get more practice at how to accept um, software contributions from the community, which is a kind of a whole discipline in itself, which we're very keen to encourage at Crossref. Um, if you'd like to know more about participation reports and how you can use it to improve your metadata, there's a free hands-on uh, session, a workshop on this Thursday, that's the 31st of October, um, where we'll show you how to assess the quality of the metadata that you send to Crossref. Um, give you advice on improving its completeness and quality. Um, and I think there'll be a link shortly in the chat to that, as well as on the slide, um, if you can see that. Um, so I'll pause here just to check for any other Q&A, but I think that's clear. So with that, um, thank you for your attention, and I will hand back to Lena. Okay, sorry. I just needed to find the unmute button over the sharing. Um... Yeah, I think we can just we can actually stay on time then. So this is our last, but also probably longest demo of the session. Um, those of you who already attended last year's demo session will have seen some screenshots already of a very, very early prototype of this tool. But I can assure you a lot has happened since then. Um, actually, so much has happened that I'd like to thank all of our Crossref ambassadors and other volunteers who have helped us so far with a lot of user testing and feedback on the early versions of this tool. Um, I think a couple of you are here. And um, today I'd like to show you what this new record management tool for journal articles uh, actually looks like in the live version, which we quietly released a few weeks ago um, to kind of start trying it out in the real world. Um, I'm going to quickly show you a few screenshots of what it looks like when you navigate through this form um, for registering your journal article metadata without having to touch 
any XML, if that's something that you rely on. Um, and I just want to acknowledge if you're thinking, wait, aren't there already a couple of web interfaces that you have that will let me do this? Um, you're right. <laughs> and I showed a slide similar to this one at last year's demo session, um, just to explain that each of the tools that we have currently kind of serves its own little niche of use cases. Um, you have to be pretty familiar with the Crossref ecosystem of various tools um, to know which one is the right one for which purpose. And each tool has its own limitations. Um, either there's technical complexity that's kind of stopped us from developing things further. So we've actually had to deprecate our metadata manager tool um, a little while ago or a medium sized while ago, which means that we're not developing it actively any further. Um, then we have a web deposit form, which is a little bit awkward to use, and it doesn't have some really important fields like author affiliations, for example. And um, it doesn't do a very good job of telling you if you're entering something that is not in the right format that our deposit system is going to reject later on and make you fail your submission. Um, and this new tool that we're talking about today, uh, we've created the user interface in a way that we've taken a simplified version of our actual uh, Crossref metadata input schema and we've turned it into uh, a form, which means that if we, whenever we make changes to our schema, it's a lot easier to, to reflect that in the interface. And so it's a lot more flexible and scalable for us to build. Um, and we can unify all of those just different user interfaces that we have at the moment into a set of forms like this that will eventually be able to replace our older, more problematic tools. Um, some of which, like I mentioned, had, have already been deprecated for a little while. And you can read more about the reasoning behind all of this in a blog post that my colleague Sarah made, I think, in 2021 called Next Steps for Content Registration. So I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. Um, read up if you're interested. But let's take some time to look at the actual tool itself. Um, so we'll provide you with a link to this at the end of the presentation. You do need a Crossref account, a Crossref login to be able to use it because it makes real submissions to our system. Um, so if you just want to play around with it or you want to test it without registering a real journal article, then uh, get in touch with me. We'll figure out how you can do that. Again, details coming at the end of the presentation on how to do this. But um, assuming that I've logged in um, and I get to the landing page of this tool, um, when I first get to this page, I see grant here as the default selection in this record type uh, dropdown. That's because um, the first such a new form that we built in, I think, 2022 was for members to register their grant records with us. And as, as Jenny already highlighted earlier, a lot, um, a lot of members have done that since then. And some of you might remember this, but um, if you click in here and you select journal article, you can get to the new form. And uh, what we mean by beta is that um, we're still developing new features on this. Um, I'm going to highlight a few of them at the end of the presentation. Uh, it is fully functional, but um, we're sort of testing out whether it meets the needs of our members and um, what else we need to be developing on it, which is why we're very keen to get your feedback. Um, so when I proceed, I'm taken to the actual form itself, and you can see a little stepper here at the top. It's uh, structured into a few individual steps. In the first step, um, I'm asked to enter the article metadata for the journal article itself. It starts with some basics like title, DOI, um, the address of the article landing page. Um, there's also a contributor section where I can add, for example, also my authors' ORCID IDs and their affiliations with a nice built-in raw lookup um, so I can have persistent identifiers for their institutions or other affiliations as well. Um, and it's important to say that uh, not every single field in our input schema is represented here in the form because that would make it so complicated that it would kind of not be useful for humans to use anymore. Um, but we focused on the fields that we know are really important. So, you know, there's things like abstracts in the uh, funding metadata, uh, any licenses that apply to the content. Um, another thing that you can see in the screenshot is that we have um, a lot of input validations in the form. So if I, I kind of alluded to this already missing 
in a lot of cases in the web deposit form. If I enter something that isn't in the format that our system would expect, then the form will complain and uh, not let me submit it because it will just lead to an error later on downstream anyway. So I, it saves users some time um, catching these things as early on as possible before there's data quality problems at a later point. The second step is uh, where I enter my journal's metadata. We've built an ISSN lookup here, which means that you can, um, I can put in the ISSN of my journal and then it will be looked up in the Crofref REST API and the form autofills my journal title from that for me, which seems probably like a minor convenience to a lot of you because you know the title of your journal. But if you've uh, registered a lot of journal articles manually with us, then you'll know that um, there is sometimes a problem people have where they make a very, very slight difference in the spelling of their journal title from what they've previously used, and then it's rejected by the system. Um, those of you who have things like an and in your journal title and sometimes use an ampersand and sometimes the word and <laughs> will know what I mean. This uh, this feature saves you uh, that headache by just making it very clear which, which journal you're talking about. Um, and I can also optionally choose to add some metadata about the issue and volume that the article is uh, is published in, but I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Um, right, and then before confirming the submission from the tool, I get a summary of all of the data that I've entered so far. You can sort of see that in the background of this screenshot, just to make sure that everything makes sense. And once I decide to confirm if there are any errors from the Crossref deposit system, I get them right away. Um, I don't have to wait anxiously for an email uh, like I do when I use the web deposit form. Um, so it all happens synchronously if there is an error, such as in this case, I have seem to have forgotten that I don't actually work for Nature magazine. Um, I will get that right away. And uh, on the other hand, if everything is okay, I'm taken to a success page that looks like this, which tells me that my submission was accepted. Um, Again, I don't have to wait for an email or anything. I know now that um, my submission has gone through and there's some handy links here that will tell me what to do next. And first and foremost, I can head over to the simple text query form um, where I can register the references for my journal article. If you've used the web deposit form before, you know this workflow very well. Um, but of course, it's not really ideal to have to go to another interface in order to complete your record. I just want to Acknowledge that on the next slide, which I think is the last one. Um, yeah, I already mentioned at the beginning of the demo that there are still things that we, features that we want to build out. Um, and one of the main ones is that the form currently doesn't have a built in reference deposit tool yet. And we'd like our members to be able to, within the same form, um, register the references for their articles because that is the basis of the whole research nexus vision that we're always going on about. Um, but we are really happy that we've been able to go live with the tool already so that um, our members can try it out and can actually use it to register their journal articles. Um, what we do also want to make easier for those members who register a lot of articles at once is to make it easier to, um, to register multiple articles in the same journal or issue without having to rekey those bits of metadata that stay the same across all of those. And then once we're actually all satisfied that we've built a suitable replacement for the deprecated metadata manager tool, um, which we know that a small proportion of our members will still rely on, um, we'll be able to transition those members over and um, sunset metadata manager altogether. And I think with five minutes left, that's it. I promised you some uh, some ways to get in touch. There is actually when you um, when you go to the tool itself, there is also a little feedback button on the right hand side that you can use um, if you just want to give us some feedback. We would love that um, on the tool itself and how it worked and what you think. But you can also get in touch with me. You can get in touch on the community forum, of course. Um, and we will share the link in the chat for you to try it out. So if you do have a journal article that you'd like to register sometime soon and you rely on our helper tools because you don't have an XML workflow set up, um, I would invite you to give it a try. So we have 
a few minutes now for some q and I I think I somebody pointed out that there was still a question for Ginny from the last session. Has that already been answered? I don't know why it's not letting me look at the q and A while I'm sharing. I can see the chat, but not the q and A. There was a question about the relationships API that we paused this year, and I answered that in chat saying the 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 need for that has definitely not gone away. Um, we're just going to build it differently um, and focus on matching methodologies and things like that in the meantime. Um, there is a question, uh, a couple of open questions. So if I understand correctly, the new record management tool will replace the web deposit form. Do you want to just, I know you said something about that. Do you want um, to just... Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is uh, in the medium to long term, the idea eventually to just have one place where members can go to to manually register their metadata. It's not going to be soon. The web deposit form covers a lot of different record types too that we haven't covered yet using the new tool. So um, that's kind of more of a, a medium to longer term vision. We do want to consolidate, of course, and not have, like I said before, so many different tools in the ecosystem that you need to be an expert to know which one to go to, uh, depending on what you want to do um, eventually, yes. Uh, and then another question, uh, maybe you can say something about plans for to support other record types, for example, book chapters in future. Ah, yeah. Yeah, we get that one a lot um, whenever we talk to people about this. That's great, but what about my books? Um, yes, we were hoping to expand these types of form, but now, now we support grants and journal articles, but of course we have a lot of other record types that um, our input schema supports. And um, we will continue to build out tools like this. Books and book chapters are pretty much at the top of the list, um, along with uh, the conference papers, which we know are also um, pretty commonly requested. So yeah, watch this space. Um, those of you who are interested in, um, in being involved in the process of building out our first prototype for a book and book chapter form, um, feel free to, you know, put your hands up by uh, by messaging in the chat or the Q and A, and I will uh, I will note you down and get in touch when the time comes for that. And then there must be at least one more question from the red dot. I see. Mm. Uh, can you register additional metadata like ORCID IDs? Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. We do um, we do have the contributor ORCID IDs. Um, that was identified as one of the important fields that we definitely want to support. Um, there is a there is quite a strong correlation between, for obvious reasons, between the fields that we um, reflect the coverage of in our participation reports and the fields that we want to support on the input side because um, those are the things that we know are kind of the basis of the research nexus and ORCID IDs are one of them. So yes. Um, yeah, if you if you don't have a Crossref login and you want to see the entire, because I only showed some snippets in the screenshots, you want to see the entire form and all the fields that are there, um, you can get in touch with me. I'll I'll show you some more details. Just didn't have time to go over everything in this session. Yeah, that choice of uh, which metadata elements to include in a, a manual form is is always a balance, isn't it? Um, there's one last question I think we'll take before moving on to the community uh, updates and that's um, not so much about the form but just our rules in in general and is there a requirement to have an ISSM before registering a new um, I guess article DOI is it necessary and it is not a requirement uh, but it is encouraged and it helps uh, matching a great deal okay I think we can move on to the next session over to Cora Hello, everyone. Uh, we are very pleased to have um, some members of our community come forward to share some of their own updates uh, related to their metadata work uh, with us all. And uh, I'll hand over to uh, Rebecca to introduce our speakers and take us away. Thank you so much, uh, Cora. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's lovely you can join us. I'm Robika Rosalin. I'm part of membership 
team at Crossref. You are now joining the first updates from the community session. Uh, the session is being recorded. We will share it uh, in the coming days to you. So don't worry, you will not miss anything and you can play the recording again at your time. If you come up with the questions throughout the session, uh, we'll be grateful if you could ask a question on the Q&A box. Uh, we will answer all the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are really excited together to bring you uh, this session. We are going to hear from our beloved community uh, about how their metadata journeys, tools, and research. I'm going to briefly introduce them. Uh, we have four speakers on this session. Each of the presenter, we have about five minutes. After the presentation, we have a Q&A session. So we will answer your all the questions. All right, um, joining me today, uh, we have Michael Parkin as data scientist, a literature services from Europe PNC. Hi, Michael. Uh, I hope you are feeling better today. Yeah, thank you. Good morning from the UK. Uh, how's the audio? Uh, the next speaker has the chance uh, from Dutch Research Council uh, NWO. Uh, Fred Atterdeen as the head of production operation from eLife. Uh, Greta uh, Pike as journal content development managers uh, and journal uh, publishers from Cyber Publishing. All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, please grab your coffee or tea or snack. Please enjoy the session. For the first speaker, I'd like to invite Michael Parkin uh, from European C, who will share about six years of preprint in Europe. PNC. Michael, uh, now I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. I just check the audio is okay. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Thanks, Michael. Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, good morning from Cambridge in the United Kingdom. Um, I'll be quickly running through our six year and counting long uh, Crossref metadata journey uh, with preprints in Europe PMC. Um, preprints were mentioned earlier as a key growth area for Crossref DOIs. Um, next slide, please. Um, so for those not familiar, very briefly, Europe PMC is a life science literature database, which has a range of scholarly literature content. And one of its key goals is to build a platform that maximizes discoverability and reuse of open access content and data. So at the time in 2018, Preprints were a somewhat emergent form of scholarly literature, at least in the life sciences. And so we were investigating using the Crossref REST API, which I think had been released in late 2016, um, as a source of metadata to add preprints to Europe PMC uh, in order to aid their discoverability um, and to incorporate in them in existing Europe PMC workflows, such as uh, searching in literature reviews, uh, citation counts, and things like ORCID, credit, and other attribution. Um, next slide, please. So preprints have been supported by Crossref since 2016, and they fall under the posted content work type. Um, Europe PMC queries the REST API each day to add new preprints and to update any existing records we have. Um, as we add new preprint servers, uh, we maintain a configuration for each of them um, to handle some subtle differences between how the servers register their content with Crossref. Uh, in particular, as I'll talk about a bit later, uh, what a, their approach to versioning is. Um, in 2018, we added about 30,000 preprints, and this has increased um, sixfold uh, to 2023. Um, although over those years we've added new servers, um, the increase is most likely due to the increased popularity of preprinting. Um, if you'd like more details on the technical approach with the REST API, um, there's a link there that I'll, I'll post in the chat um, later on. Um, next slide, please. So uh, a key aim of ours has been to try and seamlessly incorporate preprints into Europe PMC in a way that's consistent with our existing content. 
Um, for preprints, there were some early metadata challenges we had to overcome. Um, in particular, preprint versioning is ubiquitous, uh, but it's not something we'd ever dealt with with our journal content. Um, in particular, there are different approaches that preprint servers use as to how they're going to handle versioning in Crossref. Uh, broadly speaking, that's either a single DOI for all their versions or a separate DOI, one for each. Uh, and we needed to make it very clear to our users what version they were looking at. Um, after some iterations, uh, we settled on displaying only the latest version of a preprint in the search results, uh, which avoids you seeing multiple re uh, results for each version. Um, stacking those versions for navigation, as you can see in the little image at the bottom, um, and clearly labeling the version number throughout all of the website. Um, another important user need uh, is to know when a preprint has been published in a journal. Um, early on, these relationships were rarely seen in the Crossref metadata, although this has improved a lot over the years. Um, so we developed a sort of in-house, very conservative matching approach uh, in order to bi-directionally label preprints and the corresponding journal article. Um, and in particular, we're really looking forward to seeing more about Crossref's uh, strategy on this. Um, lastly, we used to see a lot of deleted content. Um, Crossref DOIs and the metadata behind them persist, thankfully, um, but preprints don't. <laughs> it was really common early on to receive requests from authors to remove a preprint from Europe PMC uh, for a preprint on a server that now led to uh, a 404 page can't be displayed. Um, as a result, we set some internal policies on how best to handle this. Um, but thankfully, this is far less common than it was. Uh, and we see more cases of withdrawal notices rather than outright deletion. Uh, next slide, please. Um, sometimes it's been less about how we use the preprint metadata and more about encouraging servers to include more in Crossref when possible. Um, early on, we regularly requested that servers include their abstracts in Crossref. Um, the abstract is really fundamental for keyword searching in, in Europe PMC. Um, more recently, we've been requesting license information to be added, um, as this is important to know when it comes to reuse. Um, it'd be wonderful to see wide uh, provision of funding metadata, but we're very conscious that that's a, a significant burden for preprint servers that don't have a lot of resourcing to uh, firstly collect and then um, provide in Crossref. Uh, and we're also, we were kindly invited to join the Crossref advisory group on preprints, which has been an excellent forum for us to give uh, our perspective on preprint metadata as a, a downstream user. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, for some more recent updates, um, we're now adding preprint peer reviews also using Crossref metadata. Uh, the example on the left is from a preprint server called Science Open Preprints who register Crossref DOIs for both their preprints and for the peer reviews that they publish alongside them. Uh, and we've also made some recent improvements in how we label, remove, or withdrawn preprints. Um, at the moment, these are based on, to, based on uh, updates to the preprint titles. You can see withdrawn in capitals uh, at the beginning of the title there. Um, we're using that at the moment in lieu of a, a dedicated uh, Crossref field for this. Um, next slide, please. So hopefully I've kept the time and that just leaves me to thank you for your attention. Uh, thank the European C Funders Group for their support. Um, representatives from preprint service to agreeing to all my requests to add extra metadata to Crossref uh, and to Crossref themselves for uh, running such an excellent service. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing very enlightening, uh, enlightening experience from European C. Okay, uh, let's take a look at uh, the Q&A box. If we have any questions, please feel free to drop your questions. Uh, we see we have three minutes left over. Are there any questions for Michael Parkin? All right. Uh, if there is no questions, uh, we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we are now moved to Hans the Chonch.
uh, from Dutch Research Council and WO, who will speak us through the Dutch Research Council and WO on the how and why adopting the cross reference linking system and the obstacles uh, that were overcome. Hands over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for having me uh, from uh, a somewhat rainy Leiden in the Netherlands. So indeed, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, introduction of the uh, grant linking system. So grant DOIs uh, already referred to by Ginny and other speakers before. Um, so for those who are uh, not familiar with it, the grant uh, cross off uh, grant linking system uh, basically is a service with which uh, funders can uniquely identify their grants by assigning a DOI, a DOI uh, to their grant. Um, the system was uh, developed uh, some uh, five years ago, over uh, somewhat, somewhat more than five years ago, uh, I think uh, uh, in collaboration with the Wellcome Trust uh, at first, who piloted the, the system. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, some 45 funders are using the, the system. Uh, and um, uh, yesterday evening when I checked, I saw that uh, in the meantime, 128,000 grants have been uh, registered and that more than 160 million publications have been linked to those grants, which automatically brings me to the why of grant IDs. Uh, why is it important to have persistent identifiers for grants? Well, basically that is because uh, funders are spending a considerable amount of time in trying to track the outputs, the outcomes of their funding, um, uh, which is which is very uh, challenging. Uh, researchers often do not report uh, their um, uh, outputs in our own systems. Uh, they often also do not uh, acknowledge uh, their uh, funding in publications when submitting their papers uh, or uh, submitting their data and software to repositories. Um, and um, uh, often uh, uh, these, the, the, the grant numbers that they, they have to report are not even uh, unique. So the, uh, the, the grant number that they would use for NWO might also be uh, similar to a, a grant number that is somewhere in use in the, in the rest of the world. Uh, and that obviously makes tracking very, uh, tracking of outputs very um, challenging. And that's precisely what this uh, cross of grant, uh, 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 grant linking system wants to solve. Um, in the uh, left column be, uh, uh, below, you see a, a uh, quote from uh, our colleague Robert Kiley uh, when this system was uh, launched, where he very nicely puts that if every funder were to uh, uh, use this system and expose their grant metadata in a consistent machine readable way, that would greatly enhance our view on the global uh, um, funding landscape, for instance, because it would allow the development of all kinds of tools to track uh, and trace um, uh, outputs from uh, from the from funding. Um, but for uh, uh, NWO, there uh, have been a few additional um, um, considerations. I would say why we adopted the grant ID uh, system. Um, so we are. Uh, uh, deeply committed to open science at, uh, at our funding council. Uh, we have open access and open data policies uh, in place for quite some time, but we also think that we should apply those principles to our own uh, data and procedures. And that's uh, what we basically are doing when you share your grant metadata with, uh, with Crossref. Um, we also increasingly see that as funders, we are part an integral part of the scholarly communication landscape and that we can also um, be the providers of important data about research and that fundamental link between uh, funding and an output. Uh, basically, funders are the only ones that can provide that data and 
uh, we strongly feel that we have an obligation to do that. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have recently seen uh, the uh, push for open uh, scholarly metadata, uh, the signing and launch of the Barcelona Declaration, of which we are also a signatory. Uh, we strongly feel that uh, scholarly metadata should be open and not closed in closed uh, systems like Web of Science or Scopus. Um, and by uh, joining this uh, grant link linking system, uh, we we want to uh, to share and op openly share our grant metadata uh, uh, with the world. So how did we go about? So um, the the this this project was run by an interdisciplinary team with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, disciplines in, involved: open science, IT, data, communications, uh, and they had to go over. Uh, they worked in three um, uh, work packages. So um, of course we had to get a, a Crossref membership. Then uh, some uh, technical adjustments were necessary to our grant management system because we decided to uh, assign DOIs uh, automatically from our uh, system. Um, uh, and then, of course, we had to adjust all kinds of um, uh, documents to inform our grantees about uh, the grant uh, ID, why, it's, why it actually is important. Uh, and um, what they can do with it, and what we expect them to to how to 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 use it. And overall, I think it it took us uh, around eighteen months from the start of the project to the the actual uh, launch. Um, for those who are also considering joining the scheme, I think it's important um, uh, that. Um, um, uh, to to uh, inform uh, or to tell a little bit about some of the important decisions that have to have to be taken when uh, implementing this system. So, if for instance, one of the decisions that you have to make is uh, whether to assign a DOI for all your grants, uh, also the historical record, so to say, or only for the new ones. We decided to go for only the new. Uh, uh, grants because we were afraid that um, assigning DOIs to older projects uh, would lead to confusion. Um, and it's also a challenge to get into contact with those uh, uh, grantees uh, sometimes. Um, uh, so we decided to go for the, the new awarded project only. Um, then a decision had to be made, of course, about which metadata to register. Uh, and here, here uh, I'm afraid um, uh, we uh, had to decide to only share a minimum of uh, metadata with uh, with Crossref. Crossref, uh, the Crossref metadata schema has um, uh, 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 optional and obligatory uh, metadata fields. We uh, only uh, register now a minimal set, uh, and that's due to an advice of our legal uh, counsel, uh, which uh, says that uh, Prostref being an, an, um, an US-based organization, um, well, that there would be issues with regard to, to GDPR, um, uh, because uh, the some of the metadata fields uh, that we would share um, uh, are regarded as personal uh, information. Um, I hope to to um, to to make steps uh, uh, in this uh, in 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 future. We launched the system in July, um, uh, a soft launch in uh, July, and went public in um, uh, October. Very positive reactions so far. The most uh, uh, asked question is, can I also get a DOI for my grant? Uh, so I think that's a very positive uh, reaction from the from the community. Uh, I'm going to end here, but not without uh, acknowledging all the people who actually this, did this work um, or are listed uh, on this um, uh, in this list on the right hand side of your screen uh, and some links to uh, uh, the system. Uh, uh, at the Crossref on the Crossref website and and some information on our own website. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Hans, for sharing the journey uh, on the Crossref grant linking uh, from that Research Council and WO. We are really uh, appreciate. If attendees or you have any questions, feel free to drop on the Q&A box at the bottom of uh, Zoom. We'd love to hear your thought as well. So yeah, let's see. We have uh, one question. Hans, can you tell us more about the GDPR restrictions? Which metadata were affected? Uh, yes, so uh, our council, unfortunately, um, uh, our legal team, unfortunately, uh, um, have regarded some of the uh, uh, metadata fields as personal inf information and because the uh, uh, Crossref is based in the US and there's there are no good uh, uh, or uh, so the, the they 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 um, uh, have a, a very strict interpretation of the of the of the of the Euro European uh, GDPR uh, regulations so uh, they advise us to to uh, only share a, a a minimal set so title uh, of the project uh, 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 um, well, I can't, I can't rec uh, re recollect the, the complete list at uh, at the moment, but but the uh, but the minimal set. All right. Uh, oh, there is another question. What is the benefit of PID for grant for the researcher or the principal investigator? For the researcher and the principal uh, investigate. Well, I think uh, um, uh, 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 if uh, grant ID is adopted more widely, then I think it can also help in bringing down the reporting burden on researchers. So we ask them, of course, to register uh, their uh, outputs uh, with uh, our funding council because we the, we do want to know what. Uh, uh, what the outcomes of, of, of funded projects are. Um, currently, they have to go through a very burdensome process and uh, and I can uh, safely say some me medieval systems uh, in our uh, uh, organization. Um, uh, but if uh, we can collect that information ourselves because uh, uh, outputs are linked to grants, then of course, researchers don't uh, have to do that anymore. So that's, I think, a very important benefit for them. And I think also uh, making it visible that they that researchers have received uh, funding from a funding council can, can be beneficial for them. You're still muted, sorry. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, we have to move to uh, other sessions. So I think you have still two questions. Maybe you can answer to the q and box. And now we can move to the next presenters. Uh, the next is Fred Atterdeen uh, from eLife. We will share about eLife on capturing present persistent grant identifier in journey in journal articles. Fred, over to you. Hi there, can you hear me right? Yep, we yep. can okay, hear you. Cool. Brilliant, so I, I'm from eLife. I'm gonna to talk to you about um, persistent grant IDs um, from the sort of publisher perspective. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with eLife, it's a, an ind independent nonprofit organization established in 2012, which is led by scientists and tasked by funders to change scientific publishing for the better. Um, we review preprints in the life and medical sciences and uh, publish these as reviewed preprints and journal articles. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in 2019, as we've heard, Crossref launched their grant linking system. Um, so as, as we know, as many speakers have um, mentioned, this allows funders to register do eyes for grants. Um, next slide, please. As a publisher, um, we're keen to follow best practice for capturing content and metadata. Um, so that um, includes ensuring 
um, author generated code and data is fair, capturing and introducing persistent identifiers throughout um, the workflow and dispersing those widely downstream. Um, we're also concerned with uh, tagging content according to best practice. And uh, so we wanted to ensure that we're capturing persistent grant IDs um, where possible. Um, next slide, please. So we collect uh, structured funding information from authors during submission. Um, we updated our submission system so as to permit authors to provide valid DOIs as well as any kind of grant ID. Um, but after making this change, we noticed that um, uptake was pretty limited. There are sort of a few possible reasons for this um, we posited. Um, firstly, not all funders are minting um, grant DOIs. Um, so that could be a large factor, but we were aware of at least one prolific funder in the biological sciences, which um, which did so. Um, so we reasoned that, that that couldn't be the sole cause. Other sort of possibilities could be that, um, firstly, the author mistakes. Authors might not be aware that a, a DOI has been minted for their for their um, grant. Um, funders may not have updated their guidance for authors on what details to include in research outputs, or, or authors may not have noticed that updated guidance. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. To help solve this issue, um, we attempted to match grant numbers to grant UIs during proofing. We have um, an in-house open source XML validation service, um, which makes use of Crossref's publicly available API. Um, and we use that to look for grant DOIs for any funding that we've captured that has an open registry, open funder registry identifier, and it has grant information. So in this screenshot, you can see there's an example of the service identifying a match within the JAPS XML for an article um, based off the metadata that's been submitted to Crossref by the funder. Um, the open funder registry ID for the Muscular Dystrophy Association and then the award ID um, within the article have matched the details um, available at Crossref's um, API. So that, that when we've identified a match, then a member of the team or our production vendors can then substitute the grant number for the grant DOI and the proofs and make the authors aware of that um, change. Next slide, please. Uh, anyone who's had to work with um, them knows that grant numbers can be rather messy. Um, obviously, this is one of the problems that Crossref system intends to solve. Um, but in the meantime, we have to deal with what we what we have. At the top, you can see an example of um, an internal um, grant number that the authors have submitted. And at the bottom, you can see the, the grant number that the funder provided to Crossref when registering the grant. And you can see that they're not an exact match. So we noticed that this is an issue with almost all funders who register grant DOIs um, and that we'll get few exact matches between what the authors have submitted and, and what's available at Crossref. So in order to aid matching, we implemented a set of rules to um, attempt to match um, a series of funders based off the data that they've submitted to Crossref and the conventions that we've seen in grant numbers in our published papers. Um, we, we've taken a, a tentative approach to this so far because we want to avoid the possibility of incorrectly making a, a match and then introducing an incorrect grant DOI into the into the scholarly record, which is something we want to avoid. Um, next slide, please. So here are just a couple of examples showing what it looks like in, in the published article. Um, we follow Crossref guidelines on how to display DOIs. So um, the, the persistent IDs are rendered as, as clickable links in full. Um, next slide, please. This is just a, a page demonstrating um, where, where one of those DOIs resolves to. You can see there's a, a large amount of information about the grant. Um, it's just one of the sort of reasons why it's, it's much more preferable to display a persistent and globally unique link within the content instead of just a, just a grant number, so a series of uh, a string or a bit of text. Um, next slide, please. And this slide illustrates what metadata we submit to Crossref and how it can be exposed and found via the um, public API. On the left, you can see that the journal article DOI um, has funding information with um, the open funder registry DOIs and the grant DOIs listed uh, as the award ID. Um, in addition, and perhaps more importantly, we're including the is financed by relationship. Um, and that means that the relationship can be found from the equivalent grant DOI record at Crossref. So you can see an example of um, on the right of the equivalent sort of finances relationship existing in the metadata for one of the grant DOIs on the right. 
So we hope that these links will provide benefits to um, funders, meta researchers, and, and various other people, when, um, especially when adoption is, is greater. Um, next slide, please. So our next steps, um, we've made some tentative progress. I think today there are 100 or so eLife articles published in the last few months with one or more grant DOIs. Um, we want to continue tweaking the in-house matching we're using. Um, we, we want to update our submission system so that if an author gives us a grant DOI, it can auto-populate some of the other associated fields. Um, and we're currently only doing this process for um, journal articles, but under our, our model of publishing, we publish reviewed preprints earlier in the workflow. So we'd like to, to capture this information further upstream. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk about. So just to say uh, thank you to Crossref for providing the system and for the uh, funders that um, engage with it. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the details. Uh, lovely to hear from your life journey. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, are there any questions? We also have a discussion on social media uh, on Mastodon and X. You can join the conversation by using the hashtag Crossref2024. We have a question here. Uh, is there a way to know from Crossref if a grant UI has been registered? Uh, well, I suppose, I'll, yeah, someone from Crossref is probably better placed than me to answer, but um, we've been making use of the the REST API that Crossref provide to, to find that information. So um, you, should, you should be able to find it there. There may be other sources I'm not aware of. All right, uh, there is a question on the chat. Okay. Thank you so much, Fred, uh, for your time. Uh, now we can move to our next speaker. Uh, next, I'd like to invite our last not but least speaker from Sarah Publishing, Greta Pike. Uh, a case study on improving our journal metadata. Brita Pike, uh, I like and over to you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Please. Great. Um, yeah, so hello from Melbourne, Australia, where it's just turned on 8.30 p.m. And I'm really pleased that this meeting's not in the middle of our night. So thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a journey we're on to improve the metadata completeness and quality for our journals. Um, next slide, please. So who are we? Um, we're part of a research organisation, CSIRO, which is Australia's national science agency. So we're part of the public sector, not privately owned. And uh, we're editorially independent. We're a not-for-profit publisher that's a part of the scientific community. We publish books, journals, magazines, and offer writer training. And we're a small team, all located in Australia of approximately 45 people. Um, and we're supported by 75 years of scholarly publishing experience. Next slide, please. So to focus in on our journal program, uh, currently we have 30 journals in our suite, two of which we're currently onboarding, which is exciting. We publish across a range of scientific subjects, including health, natural environment, chemistry, and others. Um, of these journals, we own 15 of them, and the oldest has been publishing since 1948. All the journals are peer-reviewed, members of the Committee on Publication Ethics, and have external editorial boards composed of active researchers. And as a small publisher, we pride ourselves on providing a supportive and accessible service for our authors throughout the publishing process. Next slide, please. So uh, we've put a lot of focus on ensuring the results of scientific work are presented in a ma manner that's ethical and trusted in our articles, but um, we haven't put as much focus on the metadata associated with the articles, not nearly enough. And that's sadly because it just hasn't been a high enough priority, but we all know that metadata is key. Um, and we have 
faced and are still facing some significant challenges with this. So um, I'm not quite ready yet, thanks. So um, without the resources going into this work, we have fallen a bit behind. So we have been producing full text XML since 2004, and we have been updating DTDs over the years. So currently the recent content is JATS 1.1, um, but we haven't prioritised to ensure best tagging within our XML enough or the completeness of our data. Um, and one of our challenges was that we didn't have an XML style sheet at all, so no dedicated document dictating the tagging in our XML, which has meant that our two production suppliers were providing XML with slightly different tagging. Um, we also had system challenges, so we've got our own internal um, journals content system that was built based on a print workflows and has been sort of patched up over the years, and we also have our own e-content platform hosting the journal content, which has provided us with some challenges. Uh, and then finally, the challenge of poor data, so both in the quality of what the authors are supplying and in that we've been losing data during our workflows. So a lot of big things to um, tackle. Next slide, please. So everything changed when better metadata and discoverability became more of a business priority. Um, a project team of three was given some time to focus on improving our internal systems and our XML, and this was in late 2022. And as a first step, we spent a lot of time learning and understanding why our metadata was not so great. Um, and it was hard to know where to start and where to seek feedback on the quality of our data. And this is where we discovered the cross-ref participation reports and seeing our participation report, we knew um, that we were doing some things right. So abstracts, references and orchids, for example. Um, and also by using the reports, we had a clear method to receive feedback on tagging elements that we wanted to improve. So I have to say that I'm really grateful for that resource and for all the advice provided by Crossref. Um, so to be able to better, to be able to tag our data, we needed personally to have it and we needed it to be reliable. So we put work into improving the quality of the data, both in our editorial and our production workflows. Um, we developed an XML style sheet to dictate the tagging in our XML and to ensure consistency, um, which was a big project. And we improved the tagging of certain elements in our XML to best practice um, and implemented this into our workflows. Um, with tagging changes, we needed changes to our display engine and we implemented a new content display engine and we used um, feedback from our partners or new partners to work towards producing metadata that meets their ideals and expectations. So all of these efforts are leading to richer, more complete metadata and better discoverability. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'll give a specific case study, um, which is a good news story about our funding data. So um, for a while we have had mandated declaration of funding statements in all articles, but obviously that's um, not enough. So uh, we did some work to improve our data collection and cleanup with improved messaging and requirements in the submission portal to facilitate authors to provide better um, data. And as well during the production process to ensure that the author supplied data is as accurate as complete as possible. Um, we improved our funding tagging in our XML to capture the funder name, funder ID and grant number and started to deposit this data to Crossref and aggregators in late um, 2023. And um, the results can be seen from these two little screenshots from our participation report taken last week where 25% of content has the funder IDs and 19% the funding award numbers. So um, this, this is an improvement um, in our metadata and provides that transparency on who funded the research, making our deposit more useful to the re research ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. So um, what's next? So I've got some clouds in this image here um, because we, we know there's still a lot to do and many open questions, so not everything is uh, clear. Um, we're working to improve our affiliation capture and tagging and on including and depositing ROR IDs. And we also note the move to our ROR's in place of the funder registry and have this on our list to investigate. 
Uh, we're working on including license URLs, um, so the information about license, um, the license that content's published under and a persistent URL to the terms of use. And we didn't have such a page with terms of use for our subscription content up on our site. So working on this has been a pretty, a really valuable exercise. Um, we're working on providing metadata headers for all articles, and these headers will be a part of an upgrade to JATS 1.3, which um, will mean that we can provide richer metadata for all our articles, including the PDF only content back to 1948 in our archive. Um, so we're yeah, that's that's a pretty exciting project that we're working on. And finally, we have cross mark on the cards for late next year, which is something we've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, so yes, um, next slide, please. Uh, so I'd like to thank my colleagues, Emma Proudlock and Joseph Chan for all the work they're doing on this project. Um, we feel really strongly about our journey to better metadata and to building trust in the scholarly outputs we publish. And we're really keen to talk to anyone in the community about metadata experiences or more that we can do. So please do contact me um, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Theta. Um, uh for such sharing for such an inspiring case study from challenging then how to improve yeah, richer metadata, more complete metadata and better discoverability. We can continue uh, to the Q&A session. We can uh, also, uh, you can also uh, raise your hand and we can unmute you to speak on live. Uh, you can also uh, ask a question to other um, speakers if there is any left question. Yeah, there is a question for you, Peta. Please, are the journals indexed in Scopus Web of Science or DOAJ? Hi, um, yes, they are. And we have other question. Are you retrospectively adding metadata to journals? Um, no, we won't be adding um, any new metadata um, where no. We have a question from Robin. How are you identifying funders? Is that an automated process or are you or authors looking up raw ID manually? Yeah, um, so we're using ScholarOne as our submission system. Um, and in ScholarOne, uh, authors can match their um, funder to the Ringgold um, um, to the to the fund sorry the fund ref um, database. So we'll need to figure out how to translate that to um, RORIDs down the track. But that's an automated process that, that matching. All right, that's a very fantastic update from our community. Um, we can still continue uh, the discussion on the community forum. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all the speakers and thank you so much everyone. Uh, we are really appreciate your time. Uh, I'd like to remind again, uh, I hope you found this session useful. The slides and recording will be shared afterwards. We have a break uh, for uh, 10 minutes before we move to the next session on panel discussion about opportunities, challenges uh, of the open scholarly infrastructure. The session uh, begins uh, at 10 a.m. UTC. Thank you so much all and stay tuned for the next session.
All right. Well, I think this is uh, 10 o'clock UTC, although it is 11 uh, o'clock a.m. where I am. And I'm sure it's different times where everybody else is sitting. Uh, so I think at this point, I hope everybody is gathering back. Uh, hopefully you've had your teas or coffees or whatever bites to eat. Uh, and we can now join back for the panel discussion. Yes, very good. <laughs> Thank you for showing off your drinks if you had a chance to grab them. Uh, and uh, we will now uh, promptly start a panel discussion about the opportunities and challenges for open scholarly infrastructures. And uh, Lucy Ofish will be chairing the session. I'll be in the back office if you want to uh, raise your hands to take part in the discussion uh, or put any thoughts you have about the current conversation in the chat. Lucy, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Lucy Ofeish. I'm the CEO at Crossref. Um, and I'll chair the panel on opportunities and challenges for open scholarly infrastructure. We're going to hear from a couple of our panelists, um, and then we have a few uh, guided questions. And there is the Q&A function open as well if you have uh, questions that you want the panel to touch on. Um, so to start, I'll introduce our panel um, and I'll pass around and each of them will um, share a little bit about themselves. Uh, so today we're going to be covering the um, openness across the scholarly ecosystem in general and what are the challenges and opportunities that our panelists um, have identified in that. Uh, and we'll be looking at where are there um, new initiatives that are emerging or um, gaps that are have yet to Id identify solutions for in openness across the ecosystem. Um, and what sort of challenges should we be focused on resolving in the coming <laughs> initiatives and the ones that, excuse me, um, what are the challenges that we want to identify together and, and possible solutions for them? And what is the point of it in the first place? How does the community benefit? Um, and what does a future with a more open scholarly infrastructure look like? Um, so to start off, I'll uh, introduce our panel and then they're each going to unmute themselves and give a little intro themselves. Uh, first up, uh, Ed Pence, Executive Director from Crossref. Hi, yes, I'm Ed Pence, Executive Director of, of Crossref. And um, the, I guess the focus I'm gonna have uh, on the panel today is, is from the uh, POSI perspective, the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. Um, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that in, in, in more detail, but uh, Crossref has been involved in um, lots of different initiatives uh, related to open, open scholarly infrastructure. So I look forward to the session today. Thanks. Um, next up, Sarah Lippincott, Head of Community Engagement at Dryad. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Lippincott. I'm a consultant, and I've worked over the years for a number of open infrastructure organizations and projects, including Dryad, um, the Next Generation Library Publishing Project, Invest in Open Infrastructure, and others. So I'm uh, very pleased to be here to talk about open infrastructure with you today. Thank you. Um, Amelie Church is co-director of the Sorbonne University Library. Amelie? Yes, hi. So uh, the introduction was there. And I'm going to talk today about uh, the Barcelona Declaration and why Sorbonne University is part of it. Great. Um, Joanna Ball, Managing Director for the Directory of Open Access Journals. Um, hi, everyone. Very pleased to be, be on this panel today. Um, yes, my name is Joanna Ball, and I am Managing Director at DOAJ, which is um, an open infrastructure and has adopted the POSI principles. Um, I've been at DOAJ for the last three years, and before that, um, I spent my entire career as um, 
as a librarian. So I have a I come with a kind of a library perspective on open infrastructure as well. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Anne Lee is general product manager at Eriti. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Anne. I work for Eriti, one of the registration agencies of the DOI Foundation, and we mainly provide databases, uh, based services in Taiwan and other Chinese speaking area. We are also a subscriber to Crossref's Metadata Plus uh, service. So hope that I can share and contribute some thoughts from an Asian perspective and as an open in, uh, infrastructure beneficiary. Great. Um, and our last panelist is Richard Bruce Lamptey, the deputy librarian at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Richard. Well, I'm Richard Bruce Lamptey. Uh, uh, I believe you can see my face well. I'm Richard Lampe from the Kwame Kwame University of Science and Technology. I'm the deputy librarian, uh, and I'm on the a member of the SPAC management committee, SPAC Africa management committee. And uh, this morning, I believe that we are here to discuss on this uh, open infrastructure issues. And I believe that we have got have a very good discussion. Thank you. Great. Um, so the we have a few panelists who are going to give a bit of an overview on areas of, of open infrastructure um, and considerations about infrastructure as a public good. Uh, and then we will get into questions. So first up, we have Ed Pence, um, who's going to give us an overview on the evolution of POSI um, and Crossref's um, role within it. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Great, thanks. Um, so the principles of open scholarly infrastructure um, first uh, came out in uh, 2015. There was a blog post by Jeffrey Builder, Jennifer Lynn, and Cameron Nalen. And um, they outlined um, some key areas, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, that uh, the goal there was to build uh, trust. Uh, so it, it particularly trust in uh, infrastructure, but also open infrastructure, and that it was open infrastructure, open scholarly infrastructure was criti a critical foundation for uh, open science and open, open research. Um, and so these were around uh, governance, sustainability, um, and and insurance, so community ownership and and, and community involvement in uh, various uh, initiatives and, and organizations. And so actually some of the challenges we're going to probably talk about today for um, for open scholarly infrastructure are 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 related to the POSI principles. So the blog post in 2015 started the discussion and then there was uh, the the principles uh, influenced a lot of uh, a lot of discussions and then organizations uh, a group of organizations got together informally uh, to do self-assessments and adopt the uh, adopt the principles uh, and so um, those groups also uh, issued a, an update to the principles in uh, 2020 uh, 20 um, uh, uh, sorry la last year <laughs> Updated the up, updated the set of principles, and that's what you'll see on the uh, on 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 the website, uh, open scholarly infrastructure uh, dot uh, dot org. One of the concerns, in particular, was at the time, and I think this is still a concern, is that they wanted to define open scholarly infrastructure from other types of infrastructure, uh, particularly making sure that uh, the having open data und underpinning the scholarly record was very important, but there was a, a wider concern today and um, uh, concern about what they refer to as the enclosure of scholarly infrastructure, and that if you have uh, proprietary content and services, uh, that can be a barrier to open science and open research. They were careful to say that, of course, commercial services and proprietary services are very important, and they can actually innovate and build on the open infrastructure just as anybody else uh, can. So I think it's important to get that to get that balance. But Crossref itself adopted the POSI principles in November 2020. 
And then uh, we did a self-assessment. Uh, we're going to be issuing a, an updated self-assessment uh, soon. And uh, one of the big things that changed is that uh, after adopting the POSI principles, we opened all the references uh, so that all the cross reference metadata now is fully, fully open. Um, and uh, that was a real uh, practical impact. Uh, next slide. And just to show, this is some of the detail. I won't. I won't go into it. Um, uh, sorry, just back one. Yeah, uh, governance, sustainability, and insurance are the key areas that I mentioned. And so, a lot of organizations, by going through this uh, POSI uh, self-assessment, uh, when they look at it, it actually helps their boards, helps their uh, advisory groups, because uh, it's not just organizations; it's initiatives. Uh, it actually helps them work work through some issues. Uh, and uh, the group is uh, going to be putting out a public uh, consultation to update the principles. Now that 21 organizations have adopted them, uh, there's been a lot of feedback uh, about, about the principles, and so I think we can we can improve them. And uh, so that's 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 going to be coming up. Uh, and then uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then just to show that this ties in very importantly with Crossref's larger goals about the research nexus and keeping uh, the metadata uh, open and capturing those relationships. And next slide, please. And, um, you know, we want to bring together disparate pieces of the scholarly record. We want to capture relationships and make that all openly available, but it also takes um, collaboration as well. So working with other organizations, the other POSI adopters, the other DOI registration agencies, Data Site, ORCID, uh, ROAR, uh, there's a lot of collaboration that has to happen here, and so POSI itself can help with that because organizations who who adhere to those principles, uh, it, it builds trust between those organizations, enabling them to uh, collaborate. So that's it for me for the moment. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, and the next panelist we're going to hear from is Amelie. Uh, it's going to give us an overview on the Barcelona Declaration. Um, Amelie, I'm trying to unmute you. Are you able to unmute yourself? Sorry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> that was my fault. Uh, just to present rapidly, uh, Sorbonne University as a large research organization in France, uh, we publish approximately 15,000 papers a year, which is about 14% uh, of uh, the publication of the French uh, research community in general. And we have a very uh, strong open science policy that we have had for years. Uh, so if you can go forward with the slides, uh, it would be good. But, um, and that policy is uh, really very much uh, integrated uh, with the French uh, open science policy and the European open science policy. The result being that um, one aspect of it uh, is uh, we are a university that can sell subscriptions uh, for journals and publications. And also we canceled last year our subscription to Web of Science and all proprietary databases of uh, bibliographic information. And so we have a, a lot of results on that, on going open access. The issues at the end of it for us is that uh, we needed something to monitor uh, our publication. We needed something more to monitor our research. And at the governance level, uh, we had a very critical view of uh, the rankings of universities and their methodologies, and a, a, a deep awareness of the limits of the tools used to monitor research uh, at an international level. So we chose at one point to uh, use our, our open archive repository as a monitoring tool for our publications, which is uh, a, was a big step to, to, to go to. And um, all those dimensions were linked at the time to on the work on the Barcelona Declaration, uh, in which we were very much involved. So uh, the Barcelona Declaration, to put it into context, it was uh, initiated last year 
uh, from a working group that was initiated by um, Ludo Waldman at CWTS in Leiden, Cameron Nalen, uh, who works in the Curtin University in Australia, and Bianca Kramer from Cezanne Open Science. And the goal is uh, to go for uh, to open research information. So um, to go from close research information to open research information, because uh, we need uh, we have non-transparent evidence about the way we assess researchers and institutions, and we think that uh, we need a full transparency on that. Decisions uh, leading research are based on biased and uh, on biased informations, uh, especially on languages, on geographical regions, on research agendas, and we believe that we need to do, to have more inclusive data to provide a better open research information. And then. When we work on open science, we work on open access, we work on open data, we work on open research. And then when we monitor it, we end up using proprietary data and closed data. Those are at the, so that was a big contradiction on principle on what we were doing. So we at the university, we really thought our problems met the questions uh, are, uh, are, that were um, open by the Barcelona Declaration. So that's why we really worked on it. Uh, and we think that in, as, a, as an institution, we need to go uh, towards that direction. So if you, if we want to recapitulate, recapitulate everything, uh, the research information going uh, from a closed system to an open one uh, is really uh, emphasizing the free of use uh, dimension of the information and the free uh, the freedom to reuse this information, which is essential uh, to the system. So the Barcelona Declaration has four commitments. The first one is making openness the default for the research information that institutions use and produce. The second one is to work on services and systems that support and uh, enable open research information. Third commitment is supporting the sustainability of infrastructures for open research information. And fourth one is uh, to uh, support collective action to accelerate the transition to openness of research information. So uh, the next steps after the publication of the declaration in the, that was in last April, uh, we organized a conference in Paris uh, with the signatories and supporters of the declaration. And the goal of the conference was really to work with, uh, with building a community and define what we can work on together. So having a forum uh, for sharing experiences and good practices uh, regarding open research information and developing a joint roadmap for, to go forward on this information. So for this roadmap, we have identified seven topics uh, that we want to really uh, progress on. Uh, so those are increasing the open availability of metadata on journal articles, increasing open availability, availability on, of metadata on research op, op, output uh, in institutional re repository, preprint repositories, and data repo repositories, uh, increasing this availability uh, on research funding, grants, and resourcing, Replacing closed systems like Web of Science and Scopus by open alternatives. Supporting the sustainability of these infrastructures. Evaluating open data sources for their quality, coverage, and openness aspects. And providing the evidence of the benefits of adopting open research information. So that's, that's uh, the first step of our roadmap for the next two years to work on. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, and I believe Sarah has some slides she's gonna share. Okay, great. So Cora will pass over screen sharing.
Thank you. I wanted to give a brief introduction to the forest framework, which I developed with my collaborator, Catherine Skinner, who was the former executive director at the Educopia Institute and now um, head of research at Invest in Open Infrastructure, and how the forest framework is an attempt to create a values-based framework for the knowledge commons. So specifically, the forest framework is designed to help publishing organizations and publishing infrastructure and technology providers, including repositories uh, and related infrastructures that, that make knowledge available to the world um, to help them align their practices, operational practices, policies with, uh, with academic values. One of, so a big reason that, uh, that a framework is so useful and important in this area is that there are still a lot of open infrastructure illusions out there, per pervasive illusions out there. This is something that um, Catherine Skinner, my collaborator, talks a lot about and has written about before. Um, some of these myths that she's identified, such as that all nonprofits are values aligned and all commercial entities are not or that if an organization or a, an initiative has an advisory group, that means it's community governed and community led. What the forest framework attempts to do and what many of the values frameworks and declarations and, and other projects that, that the panelists here today are talking about are aiming to provide a more nuanced view on these myths uh, and to, to help us think more strategically and in a more nuanced way um, about infrastructure organizations and, and their practices. So the, in the more nuanced view, organizations can adopt more or less ethical and responsible practices regardless of their business structure. Commu and uh, community governance require, requires active and ongoing engagement with stakeholders and the development of an adherence to defined decision-making processes and policies. Uh, so it's more than just having, having a, a list of advisory board members on, on your organization's website. So a framework can help us to, to take these myths and transform them into, help us reflect on them in these more nuanced ways. Um, and Frameworks also serve a number of other purposes that we think are really helpful to, um, to this kind of work. We believe that frameworks can help shift power dynamics so they can provide strength in numbers around aspirational values and help to normalize certain practices and policies that, uh, that the community expects their infrastructure providers to adopt. Frameworks facilitate collaboration. So when a, when a member of Dryad, for example, joins Dryad, they know what to expect from that organization in terms of its, its practices and policies beyond what you might find in the, con the membership contract or agreement or in terms of service, uh, things that are the socio-technical aspects that might not be reflected in those typical uh, agreement documents. Frameworks are also things that uh, that organizations can interact with over time. They're not checklists. They're not, uh, you know, a, a, a good or a bad. They are, they should help to reflect progress and help organizations continually evaluate themselves and their collaborators. And finally, frameworks can be really helpful tools for organizations to use when choosing to invest their resources. Um, and they can help organizations to make values-based decisions and justify values-based decisions to those who actually uh, sign off on, on investments. The forest framework in particular comprises six values that Catherine and I uh, identified based largely on a review of existing of the existing literature and, and other frameworks that were already out there. And what the, the forest framework provides in particular then is a connection between those top level values, those six top level values, principles, meaning standards of conduct derived from those values and that help to guide organizations to translate values into action. Indicators are the manifestation of these principles in terms of how a, a community operates and behaves, and evidence would be the specific documentation that substantiates that an organization adheres to an indicator. 
And in case that's a little abstract, this is what the forest framework looks like for uh, the um, equity, accessibility, and anti-oppression value. You have a set of principles, and uh, or a, I'm sorry, a set of uh, yes, a set of, of principles, a set of um, indicators, and then suggestions for the kinds of evidence or documentation an organization might use to substantiate that. And as you can see here, again, the, the forest framework encourages users to document their progress, um, not just to say yes or no, but to, to document uh, how, how the steps they're taking towards compliance or alignment with, with each of these. So we hope that the forest framework can be a useful tool for organizations to evaluate themselves, to evaluate potential collaborators or partners, and ultimately lead uh, to a more values aligned knowledge commons. Great, thank you so much. Um, so those are all really helpful kind of overviews of, of frameworks and considerations around openness that um, that each of the groups have have landed on. And I think to start, um, I you know there's kind of a fundamental question of of how do you define open infrastructure. Um, and I'd love for each of the panelists to like give us, you know, a sentence or two about how when you're talking, this is obviously we've thought through, um, you know, the implications of it and and how to govern it and ensure its longevity. But how do you how do you define it in the first place? Any of the panelists can jump in, unmute yourselves. Yeah, for us, it was really looking for infrastructures where, where the data is free to use and free to reuse and free to share. Mm -hmm. So that's the first point of openness for us. Richard, did you want to jump in? So we are looking at the open infrastructure bit where I think the it refers to the, just the, the fundamental systems or uh, services that support, uh, uh, I believe, digital and scholarly research, which is mainly designed to be accessible. The issue of sustainability comes in here, and then it should be community driven, more or less. And I believe that there are some platforms or tools and technology that enables um, information sharing and collaboration and i.e. access to resource across sectors, particularly in the area of research and educational ecosystem. So maybe that is what I, I may say. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I can add to that, I, I, I completely agree that the, the, the openness is one really important aspect. Um, you know, it is about having the, the, the services the infrastructure that is open and free to use for the community. But it, it is, that, for me, the, the community part is absolutely vital. I think it's important that infrastructures are, are kind of governed, led, owned, and we can discuss what that means, by the community, and they are for the community. They are for collective benefit, primarily. They're not there for to generate um necessarily as uh, value for stakeholders, but it's about the best interests of the community. I I completely agree. And I think that's that there you there are reflections, ways to to reflect that uh community um the the fact of being community driven in a lot of the the different practices and the different ways that that we define open infrastructure. So um, having open source code, if you're a, a technology provider, for example, is a way of serving the community interests because it means that if, if ever the original maintainer decides to stop maintaining the code or uh, the, moves out of alignment with the community interests, that code is available for the community to, to repurpose and to fork and um, to use. So I think there's that's just one example of the ways in which I think a lot of the 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 indicators of openness that we we think about are designed specifically to to protect community interests and to best serve the community. 
Yeah, so so that is why the, the transparency and the trust comes in here. So all code and uh, let's say our process are generally open. These are open, general open source, meaning they can be reviewed, modified, and let's say improved by anyone. So the issue of transparency and trust is very, very critical here. This transparency, it, it, it builds trust and allows for, let's say, continuous improvement by the community of contributors. So like just to add to what Sarah just suggested. And did you have something you want to add? Yeah, I for me, I think the core concept is to create a more sustainable ecosystem where resources can be shared to enable widespread access, collaborations, and innovations without barriers. So for I think open infrastructure is generally the basis, such as like systems tools and which can make it happen. And uh, just, <clears throat> I, I would agree with what everybody said. There, there's cer certain different indicators of, of of openness that you have to consider. And so uh, but I think both the forest framework and the, the POSI principles ad address some of those. I think it's also important to um, think about, uh, you know, there's different types of infrastructure as well. You know, so there's lots of, um, you know, there could be, you know, telescopes or, <laughs> laboratory machinery and, th and things like that that's considered that's considered infrastructure as well you know i think what we're talking about maybe is maybe is is a little bit different different from that i think there's also uh infrastructure uh that can be uh proprietary or um closed infrastructure that's still very important you know thinking about for instance uh sys maybe systems that publishers use for manuscript submission and, and, and things like that but so I think it is important to distinguish the different types of uh, infrastructure. And I think the language is really important, um, you know, because there's a term going around called uh, that people sometimes use called shared infrastructure. And, you know, I, I think that's um, uh, not a particularly helpful term because it, I think it, it helps sort of, uh, it doesn't clarify the situation, <laughs> you know, because shared infrastructure is usually used to be broader and encompass uh, proprietary and, and, and commercial services as, as well as open infrastructure. So, um, yeah, just, just to make that point. Yeah. Um, I think that's, so, uh, so I think just to add to what Ed said. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the end, all these aim, uh, the aim is to just foster, let's say, a, a sustainable ecosystem where tools and resources are widely accessible and in the end contribute to the global exchange of knowledge. So I think with all these things I'm talking about, that, is, that should be the end. Thank you. That should be the end. Thank you. And just picking up on that point, Richard, and um, also something that Joanna and Sarah touched on, the idea of it originating from a community-defined need. Is there an area of the scholarly ecosystem that there, you know, is um, an opportunity for more openness or kind of your, where you would like to see some of this focused attention on openness go? Is there, is there a particular um, area of the, of the work that you, that you feel like needs more attention on openness? Is that, is a question directed to me? Uh, yeah, if you want to start and then anyone uh, oh, oh. really. Oh, okay. Someone can go and then I can think too, sorry. Okay. Maybe yeah. The question if again has my, a... my help. Yeah. If you can real quick, that would help. Sorry. Yeah. Lucy, maybe you can real call the question again. So I didn't hear you well. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Is there? I guess what what's the next opportunity for openness in scholarly infrastructure? Is there? Is there a particular area that you feel like needs um, more directed attention to being more open? I think that open infrastructure and creating numerous opportunities for to foster collaboration 
uh, innovation and inclusivity in the scholarly communication uh, community. So by focusing on, let's say, the uh, on accessibility, transparency, and um, community engagement, open infrastructure can reshape uh, academic and research ecosystem in the transformative ways. Uh, I believe that there are some few future, maybe current and maybe future opportunities that we may offer, like IE, uh, the issue of fostering collaboration across institutions and disciplines. So where you know the issue of the um, open infrastructure where it provides shared tools and standards that encourage collaboration and in the future open infrastructure i believe that it could also enable real-time collaboration research across the continent with tools that allow researchers to uh, to securely assess uh, modify and say, publish uh, data and findings collectively there are quite a lot of things that we can look at, and it, ca it has a lot of opportunities. So, where another area where we can also look at is the empowering uh, under resource institutions and re uh, re researchers. We could also look at the area of uh, uh, enabling open, open science and data sharing. You see, but I believe that all these, in the end, uh, by it helps in continue to build and improve upon open. Uh, infrastructure. Uh, it, 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 uh, uh, it, I don't know how to put it, but by it builds and improves on open infrastructure and the the scholarly communication. I believe that it can can work towards a more accessible and, and equitable, and let's say, transparent future for research, where it fosters innovative or innovation and inclusivity in academic work on a global scale. I don't know whether I'm making sense here. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, are there other panelists that have identified kind of a gap in services that you'd like to see filled? I I would say that uh, you know I know there are lots of gaps out there in in various you know various areas of scholarly knowledge production and distribution, but I think what's missing the most is the is communication and and case studies around how the different infrastructure components that we do have work together and fit together, how you can build those full tool chains or workflows. It's something that is often much easier or well-developed in the in the proprietary or commercial space because there may be a suite of software that is designed to work together uh, and that you know is, is branded and marketed together. And it's obvious how one, you know, how information flows between different parts of the, the tool and it's easy for people to set up and use uh, as a tool chain. Um, and I think that, that that piece is very much possible with open infrastructure. And in many ways, it's more there's more possibilities of how you can connect different pieces uh, in the open infrastructure ecosystem, but it's not always obvious how to build that. Uh, and so I think that's uh, more than anything what is uh, is missing. Yeah, a couple, um, couple of areas that I can think of, uh, just say there's some really practical things that, so for the existing things, or, uh, things uh, there are things missing in terms of uh, complete and comprehensive metadata. For instance, um, ROAR identifiers in the Crossref metadata, you know, we've got sort of uh, 150,000 something records out of 60, out of 160 million. You know, so so just filling in what we already have in terms of uh, uh, you know abstracts, uh, raw IDs for affiliations. You know, I think there's a, a lot more metadata uh, that we can complete. But picking up on something Richard mentioned, there's also open data as as well. You know, I think there's still a lot of uh, fragmentation, um, and data uh, doesn't uh, get often. Uh, you know the attention or the or the credit and the metadata isn't as consistent as for instance with journal articles or the more traditional um, uh, research outputs so those are just a couple of couple of areas that i think can use some work yeah i just wanted to pick up on what what sarah was saying around the the, the, the joining up of different parts um where, where i think there is there is perhaps a, a gap. I was thinking, for example, of 
um, you know, there isn't really an, an kind of an open infrastructure alternative, as far as I know, to um, current research information systems, or isn't a system that can do it quite as well as the commercial players that I won't name here, but you know, that, that, that seems to do a very good job of that. And I think that's because there's lots of different things being being brought together. And I think that's where we can be even better as she has open infrastructures. Um, and that is collaborating. Um, that's what we do really well because we're not competing with each other. We are collaborating. And I think the, there's a huge amount of potential for us to continue to collaborate, um, to um, you know, to, to do to, to build new uh, infrastructures, to, to, to build gaps um, across us. So if again, a great example of that is RAW, of course, which was a collaboration between um, between Crossref data site and CDL. And I, if I can add, I think also one of the aspects that we must emphasize uh, when we are trying to valorize open science, open infrastructure, is the, the research integrity problem, that we need open infrastructure to defend research integrity and to, to find uh, challenges to research int integrity that happen, because a lot of them happen in a lot of institutions a lot of the time. And if we don't have the open infrastructures to question the way the research was done, we have a challenge with it in regard to the quality of the research and in regard to society in, in general. Well, since we are talking of the since we are talking of the issue of the gaps in the open infrastructure, I believe that especially in the areas where um Services are largely controlled by closed. It happens more in the area where services are controlled by closed source, i.e., commercial providers or simply uh, don't yet exist in accessible forms. And I believe that these gaps affect the sustainability, uh, accessibility, and the independence of the scholarly ecosystem, often creating um, barriers for institutions and researchers and librarians who lack. Uh, the resources to pay for proprietary solutions. And so these are some of the things that we may we may have to look at and see how the, we can move forward with it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, all those reasons you just listed are, <clears throat> they're all quite interconnected. Um, I'm curious to hear what are some of the challenges folks have encountered with running open infrastructure or kind of on the other side of things challenges you've received and kind of the how open infrastructure is received maybe by the community well well maybe um for, for me, I mean I'm I'm trying to come up with a I'm trying to give you Ghana's perspective and more of African perspective where uh, I believe the open infrastructure faces several challenges that impact its development, ability and the adoption across the ecosystem. One of it, the major ones what we look at is the funding and sustainability, because it relies heavily on grant donations and volunteer support. Which can be unpredictable and insufficient for long term uh, visibility. Unlike the commercial systems um, uh, that generate recurring uh, revenue, open platforms often uh, struggle to secure steady financial markets, making it difficult, you know, as I said, it makes it very difficult to maintain operating, you know, or let it scale up with the mid, maybe demand. And the issue of scalability and performance is also a very major issue that. We may have to also think through because um, since these some of these open source solutions face technical challenges when handling large scales of, of, of scale, scale in, in operating, the issue of interoperability uh, and, and standards is also very is something that is a challenge in, in, in where where we are. The user experience and the support is also key 
and then let's say looking at the governance and looking at governance and let's say community engagement where we need to um, uh, uh, maintain community governance over infrastructure that requires effective leadership. All these things are things that we have to, we, we, we need to look at. And there are some challenges that are happening, for instance, where I, I sit, issue of competition with proprietary solutions, also there. And then security and privacy and awareness and adoption. I believe that all these things are things that, so I believe that addressing all these challenges, which uh, it requires a, a collaborative effort from stakeholders across the, the scholarly community, including, let's say, universities, uh, funding agencies, and nonprofit organizations. And so with uh, I believe that with proper support and um, investment, open infrastructure, I, I think that can become a, uh, can be, be, be can be sustainable, uh, competitive options that promote, uh, uh, let's say, equity, transparency, and then community control in scholarly uh, communication and beyond. Great, thank you. Yeah, can, can I add some like experience yeah. from Taiwan and Asia? Yeah, I, I think in Taiwan and some other Asia countries, one of the key challenge of being open as always the funds and the governor, uh, governance. Mm -hmm. And since most funds uh, in our country are coming from the government, and sometimes they assign a department to do the task. So it kind of leads to a lack of sustainability because there's no ecosystem and it's becoming hard to attract various responders. So I'm not sure if this happened in other places, but how to attract different sectors and build a workable ecosystem will be the first priority in our case. Yeah. Can I pick up on what you were yeah. saying there and about um, uh, uh, sustainability? Because I think that is really important. And, and one challenge that I see, and I think is something that we face as open infrastructures, where you know, if we've, we've adopted POSI, therefore we're saying to the community that our metadata is your metadata. It can be used, reused, take it, um, do what you like with it. It means that we become invisible. So. Uh, and people take us for granted. So people are taking um, our metadata, they're using it, reusing it across the community. I know about some of those cases, but I don't know about all of them. Um, I know DOAJ data goes, of course, is used by Open Alex. Well, once it's in Open Alex, then it's used by systems all across, all across the world, all across the ecosystem. Um, and that means we become, a, you know, we're a building block, we're part of the furniture we're kind of overlooked when it comes to funding and funding decisions. Um, we find that researchers fund, funders always want to uh, give money to the, the next big shiny project, not to the underpinning infrastructure. So that's um, that's a challenge and, and it's very hard to seek investment for something which really is, is nuts and bolts. I think for us uh, as an institution, the challenge is going from proprietary data that was sold and very much in place and taken as granted as good data and going that no, we are going to be open and looking at it, the data needs to be worked on, needs to be improved and we have to do it. So we were the end user of a product. We just took it and analyze it and things and you have nice graphics and shiny things and then we are uh, at the we as the librarians we are now going to be at the producing part of the data so now we are talking to our publishing uh, service within the university and teaching them how to you to do DOIs in Crossref and it's changing our position on that and convincing uh, the governance and convincing the assessment agencies that what we are producing is of quality, even if it's not perfect now, it will be improved and it will be better in the next years and in time to come. Great, thank I'll, you. Yeah. I'll pick up on a, mm -hmm. a totally different thread and just 
just mention how challenging community governance, real community governance can be. Uh, you know, that's one of the, the kind of myths that I picked on uh, up on and uh, or that that Catherine Skinner uh, talk likes to talk about is uh, that you know if something has an advisory board, it's community governed. It's you know there, that there's um, there's engagement with the community. Or the community is in, involved in decision making processes. And that's not always the case. And doing real community governance with active community engagement with robust. Uh, governance documentation and and decision making processes uh, and all of that is is a lot more challenging and time consuming and this plays back into the the um, the challenges of resources funding uh, human resources for open infrastructure organizations finding the time in someone's day to do community governance uh, is. Uh, is really is challenging and it's you know it sets the the bar higher for community truly community governed organizations um uh, uh over uh, uh organizations where where there isn't a community governance model yeah yeah sarah then to add to what you just said so the the, the issue with that the project can easily suffer from fragmentation and let's say unclear decision making and let's say more of low engagement if they lack an inclusive or transparent and responsive government structure potentially impacting the project uh, direction and, uh, and usability so just to add to what you just said in terms of the governance and uh, community engagement thank you um we had a question from um let's see if i can find it cora maybe you can i think leonie uh, uh rahi makers uh, sorry i might have uh, mispronounced your name very badly i said your uh hand up, up for a little while but i'm not sure if you, you've decided not to ask a question or you still have a comment no i'm i'm happy to to still jump in on this um i wasn't sure as to how this worked so <laughs> yes I, please just the floor is down. yours <laughs> Um, basically, I wanted to comment on this because we are, I work for um, a startup that is building a lot of the open infrastructure and open source uh, things that you were talking about. And since you asked about experiences, I just wanted to kind of comment on that. Um, I think Richard very much answered a lot quite comprehensively on what the issues are. Um, but it also includes besides things like how do you finance this? How do you straddle different um, sort of sectors that come into play with this? Because you've actually got universities and academia, you've got government, you've got um, foundations, um, especially when you're working globally. In our case, we're also looking at business because you want to stay operational in a good way. So you've got VC funding. Um, so managing a lot of different funding sources is something that we have to do all the time. Uh, luckily, we have people from different different operations and sources um, with experience in these different fields. So we can bring expertise into applications for all of the different funding mechanisms. Um, but yeah, how do you make it sustainable, especially when you're trying to be open source and not have to keep on applying for funding, which I'm pretty sure Crossref is, is struggles with as well um that is one of the things um that we're largely trying to solve by indeed applying to all of these different organizations and showing our value to every single side um, of, of this um the other one is of course when you're open source how are you going to do quality control how are people going to know whether something that is published on your um, website has had a professional sort of input um, how good is the data that is being presented how good is the research that has been done and that is something that i think traditional sciences and sadly very siloed paywalled journals do tend to do quite well because of um, their review processes. And so we're trying to build in a review process where we have reviewers looking at the publications that say, oh, we have great data. Do they actually, um, can we bring in an expert to certify this? Or can we bring in an expert organization that gives out these certifications? Um, so that is what we're also trying to solve because I do think that a lot of 
free print service and open source uh, places really struggle with with this sort of quality sensing. Um, and um, one of the things we're trying to do better than a lot of these journals is actually to show and um, to show reviewers and show which reviewers are doing really well, the contributions of reviewers and ensure that reviewers are, are actually going to get um, some sort of allocation of funds or recognition at the very least of further reviews, because that I think is still lacking a lot in, in the general sort of um, system. So mm -hmm. yeah, I do think we can build these things, these open source places that cater towards a lot of different um, aspects, but yeah, we, we, we struggle just like everyone else. So we come across those, but um, we're trying to solve a lot of things at the same time. And we actually heavily rely on cross ref as nuts and bolts. So I just want to want to kind of give a thank you for that um, mm -hmm. on top of everything else. So mm -hmm. thanks for being where you are. Um, maybe similarly to recognizing um, reviewers, there can be a system where nuts and bolts like Crossref can actually trace their impact and show what they're doing and be recognized for it in, a, in an automatic, an automated way, which I think would be very cool, but that's a side idea. Yeah, I think that, um, uh, Amelie, you touched on this, the um, kind of back to the idea of openness as a as useful for research integrity. Um, and have you, what has been kind of in your conversations with um, around the Barcelona Declaration, how has that resonated that openness and, and research integrity are kind of in, entwined with each other? Uh, um, it's not, um, it wasn't a, a discussion subject, uh, especially uh, on, on the Barcelona Declaration or, or the conference, but in my university, something we really much believe is that um, if you want to identify problems to research integrity, you have to have open uh, an open process all the way from the project at the beginning and the grant from uh, the review from the peer review from the and the data so that you can question it uh if it's not open you cannot identify the problem uh you cannot see it um, the new law in france for example uh says that uh, we should be able to keep uh the data uh, from a publication for a number of years so that if you want to, if you suddenly have a, a graph in a publication that uh, you want to question, even if it's 15 years later, you should be able to have the data and question it. And so that's the, the, the challenge of openness and that's the interest of it. But if you have closed data, if you lose the data because uh, you didn't uh, worry about uh, preserving it and uh, you just have the publication and you have a graph on it and what do you do about it? How can you analyze it? How can you question anything? Um, another uh, theme that has come up from, from the discussion, and Ed, maybe you can speak to this, is um, sustainability of these organizations and um, the challenge of establishing uh, revenue streams and kind of a financial basis that, that allows the organization to really be mission-driven rather than um, kind of having other uh needs that have to be met um maybe you can talk a little bit to that and then i think others might as well have opinions on that yeah and i think this is you know picking up on <clears throat> what leonie said and and uh others um and Anne, you know about uh sustainability it is it is a challenge and you know i think it can be harder <laughs> for community driven uh open open infrastructure um, so, I, so I think there are a cu couple of parts to this is that, for, first of all, the, the time frames can be longer because I'm thinking like with ORCID and ROAR, 
and cross ref, you know, the gestation and and build up to sustainability can take take a while. So you you you've got to have that, you know, a sort of longer time frame, you know, and that that could be when you know when you have the mission and the vision, you can you can know where you want to get to, and then that can help. You know, uh, you have to get support from the community financially and in people's time, you know, to to invest in these things, and that that can that can really help. But but I think it is important for um, you know, grant funding and government funding is important, but also I think ser service revenue is just as important. I mean, that's something that, um, you know, whether it's memberships or uh, actually char charging for services. So there's a key distinction, uh, you know, between, you know, the data can be open, but then you can still still charge uh, for services. Open Alex has a model like that, Crossref and some other organizations have had that, that type, type of model where you know, we have our open APIs and open metadata, but then there can be charges for uh, guaranteed uh, response time, higher, uh, you know, higher throughput, and those th those types of uh, uh, of services that are actually on top of the open data. But but it is a challenge, and that's something that uh, Joanna mentioned around you know infrastructure by its nature. If it's if it's working, you know, it, for particularly for researchers and end users, it should it should be in the background. Uh, and, I, and I think that can be that can be one of the challenges. And I and I think this is also where collaboration can come into play. That um, organizations can can work with each other and collaborate. So Crossref and CDL and DataSite uh, got together to support uh, the ROAR registry. So we jointly govern it, and we said uh, we didn't want to set up a new organization because that brings overheads and costs with it. So uh, each of our organizations is is uh, helping financially sustain it, as as well as the community. They're they're, they're sources of of revenue. So so I think it's one of those things that it's just got to be a um, multifaceted approach. You know, you have to look at um, the, sort of a startup period um, where you know there are sources sources of revenue, grants, and grants can be used to get to sustainability. Uh, Orchid did that well. You know where they they. They got a big grant, and then it helped them build the capacity to be sustainable, uh, based on membership fees and other revenue. So, so I think so. I think it's a combination of different things. You know, looking at community support, looking at different sources of revenue, um, and and services that can be applied on it, or or just supporting something like Roar is important. So, a few organizations were able to get together and collaborate. So it doesn't cost each one that much, but together they can uh, they, they they can make it work. Yeah, if I can just follow on from from Ed there, I think you know grants and services are really important. Um, but a bit for DOEG, it, DOEJ it has been our crowdfunding model, which has enabled us to grow and develop over the years. Really, ever since we you know, moved in to become an independent organisation back in in twenty thirteen, that's something that's built up steadily over the years, and that is organisations, you know, primarily the library community. That are investing in in DOAJ because they value what we're doing, um, and I think Emily was was right that it was interesting that the observation in you know what does it mean when you're purchasing a service from a commercial provider and then when you are working with an open infrastructure and it is about that in investment um, in monetary investment in the organisation, but also just a different type of relationship where you are essentially a, a co-creator and it's in your interests and the the community's best interests for that organization to to succeed and and that's a part of sustainability it's it's not just about money it's about commitment um and and goodwill and 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 advocacy from from the community as well and well, I, I, a point okay. i'd like to add about the question of sustainability of open infrastructure that we asked this question but we never ask the same question to proprietary tools. And there's no sustainability, there's no guarantee of sustainability of Web of Science. It's a company and it's a publicly traded company. They could decide tomorrow to close the service, to do something else. 
to change the way the data is treated. And we have nothing that we can do afterwards. So yes, we are taking risk on going on open infrastructures. Uh, there are a lot of questions of sustainability. But at the end, uh, the, the interest for our institution is that the work we did, we could, if it's open, so we can take it back if the, the, the infrastructure fails. And we will try something new with the data that we had. So yeah, it's uh, we have to to ask the question on on both directions on the about the sustainability. So we, in addressing some of these uh, uh, issues, I believe that it requires a combination of many things. So as one we may say sustainable funding, sustainable collaboration, sustainable technical improvement, and maybe sustainable strategic engagement with the scholarly community. So like what uh, one strategy that some institutions like Crossref and OK they are doing is very super. For instance, we need to diversify and sust uh, sustainable funding models. Here, they have membership models. So which is similar to, as I said, similar to uh, Orchid. Orchid is also doing well in terms of the so open infrastructure project could est uh, establish, I believe that it could establish membership is funding where institution can pay annual fee like what Crossref is doing and Orchid is also doing to support operating and ensure steady income. There could also be, I believe, that um, uh, public funding and institutional investment where let's say institutions and government agencies could commit, and I like what uh, Sarah mentioned, so commit dedicated funding to support open infrastructure, i.e. treating it as a essential academic infrastructure. You get it. And then the issue of, let's say, revenue generation uh, services, which I believe that things like they can, they can come up with a premium support training or data anal analysis data uh, tools for institutions that could, uh, let's say, that can afford it while keeping core services free and open to uh, for others. There are quite a lot of things that comes in here where we can do to sustain uh, the, the, the open infrastructure project. I.e., for instance, let's say you're looking at the enhancing the interoperability through open standards would be another major one where organizations and funders could invest in, in the creation and adoption of, let's say, open standards for data and tool inter interoperability, facilitating seamless and let's say integrating access in, in, on various infrastructure tools, i.e. the API integration aspect. And we can talk more and more. There are quite a lot of things that we can, we can also look into. Investing in user, uh, let's say experience support, um, uh, developing collaborative partnership can also be another area. Or, and most importantly, the area of proprietary security and, and uh, privacy. I believe that it can also be something that we can we can strongly look at all to sustain some of these uh, um, that the, 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 this platform. And maybe another thing that also come to mind is where we can expand uh, paid and volunteer contributions, or where we can have a, a hybrid paid volunteer model, where let's say uh, we have, may have a project that could adopt a hybrid approach. To or paid of uh, paid, paid paid staff handling critical tasks, while volunteer can other volunteers can also contribute to non-essential areas or special projects, ensuring uh, stability and let's say contribution. So I believe that, as I said, uh, all these solutions can become more resilient and user friendly and competitive. Ultimately, creating a more I believe an uh, inclusive and accessible uh, scholarly ecosystem. All right. Great. Um, well, we have six minutes left and I think Richard, you queued us up well for kind of our closing question to the panelists, which is like, what is your, what are your hopes for the future of open scholarly infrastructure? Um, I'd love to hear from everyone if we can. I, we've touched on a lot of it, but um, maybe Sarah, would you want to start? 
Sure. My, my hope is that open infrastructure can have the resources that it needs to thrive, not just, just merely survive. Um, and also that uh, open infrastructure communities and organizations look, uh, look to the values frameworks that we've talked about today to help, um, to help align themselves and improve their policies and practices because there's always room for growth, even in, in the best, most well-intentioned um, communities. Maybe, do you want to... maybe I'll say oh, my... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. but all, what I'll say is that my hope for the future of uh, scholarly infrastructure, I believe, merely will center on building uh, an inclusive and, and, and resilient and globally accessible ecosystem that, let's say, genuinely serve the academic and research community uh, diverse, diverse needs. But ultimately, the vision, uh, my vision, as I said, is one where knowledge flow, flows really equitably and sustainably. <laughs> with communities around the, the world contributing to and reaping the benefit of a collective global knowledge commons. That's what I believe in. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I will go in the same way, uh, same direction. It's uh, really the community engagement in the infrastructures and the commitment to improve uh, the quality of the data, of the openness, and for whether you're an organization, an institution, a publisher and everything that it's a collective work uh, to to do. I also want to agree with what Richard said. I think the global access uh, accessible is really important, especially for like Asian regions, because even we got the infrastructure, I think the language barrier still exist. So I personally expect that Maybe we'll figure out a way that we can like, I, I don't know, we can just break the limit of language and thus make all the research outcomes really being discoverable and visible to different regions and different language users. Yeah, that's what my expectation. <laughs> Uh, should I try and go next? It's hard, quite hard yeah. to go after those because I agree with everything that everybody has said, and it's quite hard to find something, something new. But I, but I, of course, I also hope for a, you know, a really strong, um, open infrastructure uh, that continues to grow, um, that continues to collaborate. I think we've just seen a massive boost actually from the, from the Barcelona Declaration, and you're seeing the numbers of organisations that are really getting behind that and are hopefully going to put their money where their their words are um i think that's really encouraging for encouraging for the future yes so i'll go i guess uh, yeah i mean i agree everybody expressed things very eloquently so thank you and uh, i think a globally accessible sustainable infrastructure is is definitely uh, something that um, I would like to to see you know we're, we're part way there we've started to do some things but there's a lot more we can do and I think a lot of that will a lot of the benefit will come with uh, better and more collaboration uh, between the infrastructure organizations again we collaborate to a certain extent but I think that um, uh, you know there's 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 more to do you know we want to uh, improve and and build on on POSI and the forest framework, the Barcelona Declaration, uh, but there's there's a lot uh, more to do. And I think, you know, Crossref's doing some work around um, how uh, we're resourced and making our fees more equitable. Um, you know, most of our uh, members are now in, in Asia, as Jenny reported earlier, earlier today, uh, and we're seeing lots of uh, membership uh, growth in, um, uh, lots of different uh, countries uh, and um, Pakistan and um, in uh, other places where, you know, our fees uh, aren't uh, easy to pay. 
and um, you know, so we want to we want to try to address that, and I think that will really help with inclusivity um, and uh, inequity across the across the uh, infrastructure. Great. Well, we are right on time. I want to thank our panel for a fantastic discussion and and for your insights. Um, and I believe Cora is going to take us into the next panel, but just thanks everyone. And thanks for those that joined and had questions in the chat. And um, yeah, reach out if you have more questions or follow up uh, from the discussion. All right, yeah, thank you very much uh, to the panelists for the great discussion. I could not agree more with pretty much all the points, so fantastic. Uh, and the last thing for us to uh, that is left for us to, to do is um, to go into um, breakouts to reflect about some of the themes that we have covered today. Uh, so uh, we have not done it in the past, uh, uh, we have not done it previously, but what I'm going to try and do. Uh, is to, in a moment, uh, offer everybody an option to select which um, breakout group you want to join. And we're hoping that each group will be able to basically have a free um, conversation about the topic that is presented. So the group number one will, can talk about the integrity of the scholarly record, and Madura will be helping to facilitate that conversation. Um, I will have a pleasure to talk to you about the, or oh, with you rather, uh, about the resourcing crossroad for future sustainability. So if you have questions or comments about this particular topic, please join me in group two. Um, and then Dominika Katrick will be talking uh, with people interested in the research nexus. So kind of um, making uh, more complete metadata and uh, making sure that we capture as much of it as possible. Uh, and then uh, also, uh, if you're not interested in, in, in talking about a specific topic, but rather have general reflections on your mind from this meeting so far, uh, you can join Evans. Uh, so the breakouts will open momentarily. Hopefully I will try to do that. Uh, and uh, then uh, they will close uh, at 11.40 UTC. So we'll have um, just short of half an hour to be able to do um, to discuss things relatively uh, informally in those groups. Uh, so I would also like to make sure and invite the hosts to correct, to choose the correct group before you, uh, before you leave. Uh, and here we go. You should be able to now join one of the rooms. I can see that people started filtering through to their rooms. That's great. We still have just over 50 people. So please select one of the one of the rooms. Uh, just a word of warning, obviously, because I am here, I cannot at the same time being in my room number two. Uh, so I'll I will join it uh, when I see that most people have already selected their, their group. OK, we still have just over 30 people uh, who have not joined any of the rooms. Uh, obviously, if you uh, if you're actually idle because you're working on something else at the moment, that's fine. There's no there's no uh, compulsion <laughs> to to join one of the rooms. Uh, but if you wish to continue a conversation about any of those topics, uh, please join one of uh, one of the rooms uh, that I've mentioned. So as I say, the integrity of the scholarly record in room one, resourcing crossroad for future sustainability in room two, uh, research nexus in room three, and general reflections from this meeting in room four and see you here and uh, at 11.40 UTC. So yes, let's join our rooms and have a bit of a chat. Somebody is already closing the breakout groups on my behalf. Thank you very much there. Uh, and yes, I wonder, as people are coming back, uh, I think most have already, not everybody. Uh, yeah, I wonder if I could hear from the facilitators of the groups how it has been. Have we got Maduro with us as she was running the the work? Um, oh yes, Maduro is here. You you were facilitating the breakout group to, uh, that was talking about the ISR. Could you just uh, Maduro in like basically a a sentence or two summarize how the how the discussion has have gone or which directions you were taking? 
Sure, thank you, Cora. Uh, yeah, so I was in the breakout room and we had some people talking about integrity of the scholarly record. Um, uh, we mainly talked about um, the different metadata elements that are important for signaling trust. So things like uh, publication dates, um, editor information came up um, and how um, uh, one participant shared a very interesting idea that it will be useful to see the submission history of journal articles to see where they were submitted and trace the history of that to be able to, um, I, I think that would signal integrity of the publish, pu publication process for that article. So uh, we discussed a few ideas on what metadata elements could help there. Yeah. Thank you, Madhura. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, so I was uh, um, facilitating the um, conversation in a small group uh, interested in the um, resourcing Crossref uh, for future sustainability project, uh, and we first focused on the topic on the topic of um, uh, the basis for the fees uh, of, of, of Crossref membership fees, uh, and whether or not uh, the publication. Um, revenue or expenses are a relevant measure there. Uh, we had uh, Ryanen from one of our sponsor organizations, I, uh, yes, Ryanen Miller from one of our sponsor organizations um, kind of talk about this specific topic about how uh, it can be quite problematic to potentially even set up what should be or would be the, the um, uh, starting <laughs> uh the starting level of or a tier for a member so that's what the sponsors are, are struggling with because not not all uh, organizations uh, that belong to crossroad and that would like to and have re relevant um content to register with us actually uh are publishing organizations in the um you know in, in, in that sense may not have any <laughs> uh any revenue or expenses related to that activity um, that might just be a side kind of uh, sideline for them. Uh, so that we started there. We talked about potentially cons considerations for different levels of uh, different means of um, providing equitability of cro uh, uh, in cross ref fees and and how that is being currently carried forward with in re through research uh, about which direction we can take it. Uh, and we also had uh, now I. Uh, I'm terribly sorry for not remembering the name. Uh, we had a gentleman from Wiley, uh, who uh, Robin, sorry, uh, we who talked about um, the opportunities of uh, looking at uh, bringing more revenue through the service provision and basically on, on the metadata consumption end and and how would how is Crossref uh, considering that? So that was our conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, and we had Dominika talking with uh, her group about uh, Research Nexus. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that was a really interesting conversation. Um, we talked a little bit in the beginning about the um, the roles of different stakeholders in you know, building the, the Research Nexus, uh, making sure that the metadata and relationships are available. Um, um, we had a good chat about the, some challenges and obstacles, uh, primarily on the on the publisher side um related to how the how the metadata is uh, is input into the systems um uh, we touched a little bit on different metadata sources the the, the quality of those as well um uh, there is there seemed to be an interesting open question uh, around to what extent crossref and similar organizations should actively enhance the metadata using uh, available sources and perhaps um, other strategies as well thank you Thank you, Dominica. Uh, and finally, uh, the group that was uh, reflecting on the day uh, was uh, led by Evans. Thank you, Cora. So we were five uh, members, surprisingly all Crossref staff members. And so we had more of an internal reflection of our thoughts based on what has happened since morning on the sessions. Um, and I think this, uh, uh, most of us will agree that we've had very insightful discussions and had um, good feedback, most on the community feedback and the panel discussions that we've just had. They were great, great input on how we can support uh, the open infrastructure, how we can promote it, and how we can also support progressive models that are coming up that um, are really promoting this um, open infrastructure models and also adopting adoption of policy uh, principles. Yeah, that was in a nutshell. Thank you. 
Thank you, Evans. All right. Well, uh, thank you to everyone who has uh, been with us through this first half of our uh, annual meeting. We will now take a main break uh, from this program, uh, a couple of hours uh, to uh, rest from potential Zoom fatigue, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to see most of you back here uh, for our second half of the day from 2 p.m. UTC. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk more Crossref, more metadata uh, with some updates about upcoming, um, uh, upcoming metadata uh, schema updates and uh, also some uh, a session to talk about the the kind of um, different tips for using the Crossref REST API. Uh, we'll also look at the state of Crossref and uh, we'll have the all important um, uh, board elections uh, concluding uh, as part of that session, as well as more feedback from the community. So thank you very much and see you back at 2 p.m.